one. Hey everyone, Douglas here, and welcome back to the MMT Macro Trader live stream. As always, Bijou Smith is joining us uh, from the other side of the world, almost quite literally. Of course, I'm on the other Try side it. of the world for him, but nevertheless, welcome back, yes. everyone. Bijou, welcome, man. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of the chat as well. Yeah. Things yeah. are going all right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, still got so many more ideas to model for modeling that I then I can have the time to uh, actually write. <laughs> but, uh, you know. <laughs> Well, well I, have to, I have to admit, Copilot does does help ooh, with the typing. Ooh, it does. Just that tab key. <laughs> that tab key. Is my my son trolls me quite often with Copilot. He's like, Dad, are you are you hitting tab and hitting enter again, or, or are you are you programming? <laughs> yes, are you actually programming? As you like to call it, and I'm like, No, son, no. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you, like, well, like you, you yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, well, and Josh, okay. welcome, man. Yeah, if you're in the chat, guys, make sure you say hi. Let us know you're here. Drop us a line. If you have any questions, send them our way as well. Uh, before we, before I get into my my you know quick anecdote story, we, we have a, an awesome lineup for to you or for everyone tonight. I have a lot I want to uh, discuss. BG's got some good topics to discuss, and uh, I have some really fun stuff to show as well. Putting the finishing touches earlier this week on a project that uh, I've been spending the better part of six months working on, some deep learning stuff uh, that is uh, really kind of finally coming to, to focus and, and have a production model done, ready to share, uh, kind of show you some of the things I've been working on. So yeah, we just have a lot to discuss, but um, back to co-pilot. Oh no, back to programming. Um, <laughs> I I actually had to like do some programming today. Like I actually had to figure out if yeah. I was yeah, because um, I, I I what, what the, 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 this is this is just how stupid this all is now, right? The problem with ChatGPT uh, is I don't know if I can trust to say like, hey, can you go back, <laughs> you know, way at the start when we were talking and change this one thing for me, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, so I had to, I had to go, you know, do the old fashioned thing to find out if, if I was, uh, cause what I wanted, so I had a, um, I had a start date, right? I needed a variable start date so I could jump in and, mm -hmm. and like cut actually, I mean, actually have any data prior to that start date get deleted. It used to just be the entire mm -hmm. data set, but I needed something. And, and I was pretty sure I knew how to do that, but um, mm. I wasn't positive. And, and I've really, yeah. I've become a, a, a slave to uh, <laughs> to the oh, chat yeah. GPT because I had to figure it out myself. So uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, but you know, you're not, you're not so much a non-programmer in that sense. Because e even if I'm, um, you know, uh, just doing rapid application development or, or even C++ or something, you know, <laughs> more more robust that you, you always test the code i mean yeah you write a few lines that's yeah. the usual the old style development you'd write a few lines and then you run the code <laughs> in even c plus plus you'd even you know you'd have to compile it and run it and you know you do a whole cycle you well at least at least the better programmers would do that way that they'd write some code very few lines and then run it and test it yeah you'd have to write a block of code that actually completes you know <laughs> but but yeah, it's, it's it's just the way you're doing it, and and the the tools with Chat GPT and Copilot are just you know speeding that whole thing up because um, but they don't get away from the trust. You have to you have to run it to test it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to tell me like back in the day, yeah. you you guys would effectively go the route that like a yeah. Jupyter notebook takes you today, where you yeah actually r yeah run a block, find out if it works, right. move on to the next thing. And then eventually clean it up, piece it all together in one. That's right. Or okay. Okay. That's exactly. Interesting. And that's Jupyter interesting. Notebook actually, can't, you're like, like you're right for Python at least. Uh, that that streamlines that as well. Yeah. Because you can get instant output. Yeah. And um, it's a little squirrely though, right? Because you know the way it runs code out of order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It always takes me a while to get used to. So, I, I so often just restart the kernel. <laughs> Of rewritten, re rewritten over some variable. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, still, I, I, still yep. good. I know exactly, <laughs> exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. Let's see. Man, it, it has been a fun week this week. DC week. What the heck is going on over there in that little blob of land? In DC? Pacific oh, in well, that hasn't been Pacific the fun. Pacific and Atlantic <laughs> That hasn't been the fun part. That's been the, the hair-pulling, frustrating part. Um, 
the fun part has just been there's been some fun kind of MMT stuff happening in the Twitter sphere, Twitter oh, yeah. sphere and uh, yeah. the, the Applied MMT podcast. Just awesome this week. I want to touch on some of that. The sad part right. is what is happening uh, in that small, <laughs> small nation city, nation yeah. state city, whatever DC is, uh, yeah. with the uh, the DC yeah. DC. Yeah, the DC DC. Um, Th- this is this is my take. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just jump to, right. just jump to the the Google search here for debt ceiling and, and kind of how I'm 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 seeing this play out in real time. I mean, it, it looks like the Democrats and the Biden administration have really uh, really backed themselves into a corner, right? Because they've they've promised they won't default. Which yeah. means then, <laughs> like you're giving. I mean, in other words, you're playing the game of chicken, and you're saying, "I'm not going to get into a car crash." So whatever happens, you, you know, I'm going to get off the road, right? Uh, uh-huh. And, and it, I mean, it sounds like then that there's going to end up being spending cuts and, and other uh, yeah. you know, kind of quasi austerity stuff yeah. that uh, that will end up happening. Um, yeah. And that's kind of how I'm reading it: is that ultimately there won't be a default, yeah. but there will Soft. be. Spending. Soft recession pressures and then, through austerity, but it, it, even even then, it, with the inflation, it's the poor God. that bite yeah. bite the this has is, to eat the inflation, and the poor will eat eat the spending cuts. It's like so gross. Yeah. That is, yeah. I mean, that is the sad part too. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just ridiculous in, in in my eyes too. Right? Is you have a Federal Reserve? I, I know they. I know they're thankfully very unsuccessful at this attempt, but you at least have monetary policy saying, hey, we need to do what we can to increase unemployment, right? So, I mean, let's say, let's even say they understood what they were doing. They want to increase unemployment. And now you're having the fiscal side say, and we don't want to pay you if you're unemployed because we want you to have to go find a job, right? Yes. Which, yes. So, the... <laughs> oh, pa- pa- pardon my language, but how the... Is that supposed yeah. to work? I, I mean, oh, well done. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how's yeah. that? How's that supposed to work? Right? I, like now, again, thankfully, the Fed, the Fed has it backwards. Um, but yeah, th- th- that yeah, is that is what's being proposed right now, and and I, I just I, I don't yeah. have mu- I don't have much of a heart. But when it <laughs> when it flutters <laughs> up, and I and I <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, those inner, inner de- depths of uh, human- humanity yeah, in you. Yeah. yeah. When I look at my <laughs> fellow human being and I can see a, a little bit of myself uh, in them. And, maybe they're worth saving. I yeah. Don't know. Uh, yes, no. It depends on the day. <laughs> if, I'm, if, I have, uh, if, I, if I have as much you know, pity left in, <laughs> in myself to throw at them like the spare change that I have oh, in my God. pocket. Um, yeah. <laughs> then I think to myself, this doesn't seem right. Um, so yeah. much you could write on this. I, I do, I do recommend people go to Applied MMT podcast episode 13 to also Ooh. get their take on it because it's pretty juicy stuff there it is yeah they, they had a great one we'll talk a little bit about that i've got some links pulled up some things pulled up to discuss and uh some of the discussion they had actually what was great about uh episode 13 i'm a youtuber uh so mm-hmm. I, I mean that not in the sense that like i'm quite literally on youtube making content oh, for you reading books fast yeah what, what i mean is i watch and pictures. listen to anything on youtube uh yeah i need pictures <laughs> YouTube books. oh my god uh, you sent me uh, uh, contact info for someone who's interested in kind of what we're doing over uh, over at the oh, Patreon yeah, and right. what. Yeah, yeah, and he gets back to me yeah. and he's like, "Yeah, this is great. I got to respond." He responded to me earlier today. He's uh-huh. like, "Yeah, this is great. Do you do anything in writing?" <laughs> I'm like, oh man, like <laughs> nope, oh, nope. Man. I'm a video. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing a lot of writing on yeah. the AI stuff just for fun. So yeah, so it does. Oh, I feel it, yeah. it does make me wonder though. Can I stick my transcript? in the video oh, of the video that, that YouTube produces into chat yeah. GPT and will chat GPT spit out, uh, spit out report. Uh, yeah, yeah, spit out a good, a good, well-written summary of, uh, you know, of, of what I oh, did, yeah. but, uh, pretty sure it will. I mean, you'd have to edit it a little bit. Uh, but anyway, I listen to podcasts and everything on, on YouTube. So that's why I'm bringing it up on the, on the YouTube. That's why you can see it here. Applied MMT podcast number 13, you know, they titled it James Madison, but really the best part of this is when uh, I forget, uh, 
Got it. Ryan. Ryan, and then who's the other? Adam. Adam. Okay, Adam is the guy who actually runs the account, right? Right. Ryan is the banker that. Uh, I mean, he's the, he's the banker that joins. Okay. Yep. Ryan had some really good points about how high interest rates affect banks, and this is just one of the things where um, I have noticed that at least you could say like uh, I, I've never I, I didn't know enough about the banking structure, especially when I was first kind of digging into this to understand how a bank would potentially benefit from higher interest rates and then ultimately the, the higher income flow from the, the higher interest payments that that would be. But I, I could see, if you will, kind of the, the shadow or the, the observed effect of that, right? The outcome uh, of that in the larger ma- macro flows that, that higher interest rates, you know, you know, effectively heat up the economy, right? You know, so I was able to observe that, observe yeah. that. He did a great job of laying out exactly how banks benefit and ultimately expand their balance sheet yeah, because of right. higher interest rates, uh, which then just got me thinking on a, a, a plethora of other items um, that I want to discuss tonight. And eventually that's going to lead into some mm-hmm. looks at some Minsky models, some system dynamic stuff, and hopefully mm-hmm. bees you a discussion you and I can have just kind of real time to try and figure out some things that, I, you know, we were yeah. talking about this yeah. before we got going, but I think we're both in agreement that there's some, I don't want to call it counterintuitive, but for, for the sake of the argument, I'll call it ca- kind of counterintuitive aspects to the higher interest rates that I think we've all understood, right. at least the, the, the Mosler MMTers have understood. Yeah. But I think, I think even at the banking level, uh, there's some counterintuitive effects there. And, uh, and, and I, I tried to go into this last week a little bit. I don't know if I articulated it the, as, as well as I could have, but I'm hoping to do it equally as well tonight where maybe we go a little bit yeah. into why maybe even a pause in the rate hike cycle can be problematic. So, um, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So that's kind okay, of what I, I, was, I yeah. Hear your thoughts on that. Um, I also, I also want to know about, you know, the debt floor. Why is it? Why isn't anyone talking about the debt floor? Ooh, yeah, yeah. What about the debt floor? Yeah, you know, the debt floor. You know, you, you sort of the government sucks up all the cash, deletes all the deposits, and stops issuing any anything. Uh, no debt. The debt floor. Or how about the debt uh, basement? Debt basement, mm-hmm. or even go down to the debt dungeon. <laughs> the no d- the debt dungeon. <laughs> dungeon. I like that. Sort of, it's like we we all get busy, you know, you know, when we can in between uh, our, jo- our work hours. We, we all we all get busy printing our own currency or m- minting our own coins. Yeah, and we, then we give it to the government, right? So then the government can pay us back, so that we then we can you know pay uh, government tax back to them. <laughs> It's a debt dungeon. Well, a lot of a lot of waste of human, you know, effort printing our own coins and minting it. Give it back to the government. Then the government can pay us. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking then we've, this. Got, then we've got then we've got our own money back to pay our taxes. <laughs> Genius. Debt dungeon. The debt dungeon. Yeah. The debt floor. Uh, no. Yeah, I, that, that would be a fun discussion yeah. to have. Yeah, we, yeah, we we need to decrease the debt floor. We need to build a debt basement. Yeah, debt basement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be a real unfreedom party person, that's what you got to do. Um, you get this debt ceiling. Uh, that would be, I mean, that would be a hellish economy to live in. Live in. <laughs> Oh, okay, I okay, know. okay. It's clicking. The only way you could get a debt dungeon is yeah. if the country starts selling off its real assets, right? Like, like this is exactly how it can happen. So, uh-huh. so yeah. Ron, Ron, gl- glitchy Desantis. We take a gold bar. We, we we get a we get a gold bar and we grate it. I mean, you know, you just use an adamantium cheese grater thing. The gold then just grates on it like parmesan, you know. Take your gold bar, it goes into a million pieces, right? And then and you get a mite. Then the next day, because of deflation, you, you take a little bit of the grain of that gold and you and you have a little micro cheese grater. And you keep grating, <laughs> just keep doing that forever and ever and ever. I, I think I think you know, I was I think I was thinking how, how we could actually get into a debt a debt basement, right? Because a debt basement, yeah. then if there's a debt ceiling, the debt basement would be 
that there is such a massive surplus, right? That right. We, we do not have a national debt, but we have a national surplus. And I think the only way we could achieve that is by selling off national assets for the U.S., like uh, the Washington Monument, for example. Right. So, so we actually, yeah. So, yeah, right. so, so we get too literally, we get, we get, we get, I'm I'm, <laughs> we get, we get Ron the 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 Ron the glitch DeSantis uh, yeah. to become president. Right. I don't know if you heard his his Twitter. Uh, oh, he he launched nice. his uh, presidential campaign on Twitter, and it was a glitchy mess. Um, oh, gosh. What's going on, Daniel? Welcome over. How much for the the Washington Monument? This is what I'm thinking. So he goes to sell it, right? And uh, you, you know, you get some company. It's uh, uh, like F- FTX buys the rights to the Washington Monument. So it's it's the Washington Monument brought mm-hmm. to you by Crypto FTX, yeah. right? All right. All right. And that that is how. And I mean, just think about all the things we could we could slap sponsorship names onto and sell to the private <laughs> sector. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bunch of soup up the wazoo. It's uh, it's uh, it's no longer the what? It, who is it? The Ed, Edgar? Crap! What's the name of the? <laughs> what's the name of the uh, the Federal Reserve Building? Uh, Federal oh, Reserve. I build, Edgar, I know it's Hoover. Uh, a... Federal Reserve Building. The Eccles. Yeah, yeah. So it's no longer the oh, Eccles yeah. Federal Reserve Building. It is the Heinz. <laughs> Federal right. Reserve Building, uh, owned by the uh, yeah the the Heinz oh, Corporation. Very Marinet Eccles-ish. <laughs> if the ask economist guy, is that who is that who it is? Uh, yeah, must be yeah yeah. Ron the sales tax is what a Trump ad called him. Yeah, can't lie, pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. The, the Trump attack ads can get pretty funny. I mean, they, they've they've mm-hmm. got a they've got a good team. <laughs> uh, yeah, Marinet Eccles. The Fed building, yeah. Anyway, okay, I'm I'm gonna get off on that uh, that tangent there and get back to uh, get back to the debt ceiling. You know, we'll see we'll see how this goes. We have seen some selling in the markets over the last couple of days that has been a bit concerning, but we are post op X, and and for those of you who aren't active traders, active investors, oftentimes. Um, if, if, so there's an op cycle, I've gone over this a hundred times, uh, I, I'm not going to waste too much time, but hedging takes place in the markets. The hedging cycle is on a monthly cycle. Um, when the hedging cycle resets, about a third of that hedging activity gets reset. So there's a window of opportunity for the market to kind of shift direction. So oftentimes you'll see after a, a long run up, which we've kind of seen for, for a, a month now or about six weeks, a nice little rally here. When you hit an OPEX cycle, oftentimes the OPEX cycle, if you know, if you've pushed higher into that OPEX cycle, you'll see a bit of volatility pop and price push lower than vice versa. If you've been seeing a lot of selling, uh, oftentimes you'll see the OPEX cycle be the bottom of that selling and then you get a reversal. Uh, so it, no surprise that we're seeing a little bit of selling. And at this point, I don't know if it's directly tied to an increased risk uh, for a debt default, but uh, I, I'm still betting. I'm still long. I'm still betting. Yeah, OPEX is a is an options thing. Um, options expiration is what it stands for. So I'm still betting that that there, there won't be um, a- absolute calamity from a, a debt default. But uh, mm-hmm. it, and it's important to it's important to note too that you know it's really going to be starting at the beginning of June. That it's it's not like a debt default end of the world. But what is going to have to happen is it, it'll be. There's gonna have to there's gonna have to start being decisions being made on what's gonna get paid and what's not gonna get paid and um, obviously if there's a default there's you know the immediate fear trade that happens but then there's the subsequent okay decisions are gonna be made on what what expenditures are actually gonna happen um, and what aren't there's gonna be this prioritization schedule and of course in the infinite wisdom of policymakers, at least back in 2011 and I think 2013, when we got close to this exact same situation, they're going to prioritize interest payments <laughs> on bonds. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so that means you know uh, the, the 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 most important spending the government does, at least from a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, Social Security, food, uh, you know, food stamps, other welfare. Um, Medicare, that sort of thing, you know, those will probably get cut first. <laughs> and uh, but but don't worry, those who have money, uh, those who have yeah. money will will continue to get their money. So yeah, it seems um, like it. It's, it's who who the unfreedom party want to get their pound of flesh from, I guess. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. So we'll see. We'll see how that continues uh, continues to play out. But I'm I'm not seeing any indication yet uh, that that a default situation is is absolutely imminent. Yeah. But it, it could end up being. And I, I I guess what I'm trying to say is the selling we've seen in the last two days in markets I don't think can be directly equated quite yet to uh to debt ceiling stuff although we are going to start getting close um to, to getting yeah get, getting close to the point where we're <laughs> getting close to uh some some real damage being done yeah. because of the, the lingering fears what does this what does this do to the elliot ways <clears throat> because you're talking about like restriction fiscal flows and you know sort of macro level effects so the, seems very exog- exogenous right so yeah the the real Elliott Wave believers would say the Elliott Wave is always right, and, oh. right, and, and you know that 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 the outcome is you know predictable, if you will, or baked into the wave formation that that is heading to this Seriously. point. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't go that far. I but, wouldn't go. I think it, I think it's a endogenous behavior. The, yeah, the psychology, like you explained last week. This would be different. It's a question of really how. How the stock market, um, how much it is really deco- decoupled from uh, a real economy where people are really suffering and unemployment. Um, yeah, how, how that affects the stock market. I, I, I'd sort of tend to think not much, right? But, so again, it's a bit, of, it's still psychology, nerves. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, players, uh, actors getting a sort of mob psychology, getting a bit nervous and... Um, yeah, eventually things will things will uh, calm down. I imagine. Hopefully, <laughs> more things get really crazy, and uh, we end up seeing <laughs> Armageddon play out. Yeah, but, yeah, the army. Oh, that's what. Yeah, that the Normanator and I want to see. It's not the definitely push that hard ceiling <sighs> button. And, uh, God. Yeah, well, there'll just be such a such a you know, I don't know, revelation to the Unfreedom Party or not because. The one one tweet I had was that you know they um they they might actually understand MT very well <laughs> when it's all said and done like, when it's they all just want done. to destroy yeah. government they just want government to look responsible for you know the chaos yeah yeah I, yeah they can just strip government away down to a, like a skinny bear sort of you know waif of a entity which that's which my, that's one one theory. yeah <laughs> which we know really what which we know really means. Um, they don't actually want small government. They just want government isolated. The, the power of government isolated in the hands of very few. Yes, that's right. Right. This is, this is what you get on MMT yeah. macro trade, right? There's yeah. the only place you get this these insights of like tall, skinny government versus short, fat government, and all these other metaphors. But the multiple dimensions you, of government. You, yes. You hear them yeah. first here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 The, the New York Times ten years from now will finally be picking up on it. But uh, picking up on these. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, these these insights that are only available. Yeah, yeah. Are we are we on the Internet Archive somewhere? Wayback Machine. Yeah, yeah. Um, up there. We, we've got to be searchable by the next GPT models. Oh, anything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you wrote down on your notes too about the video GPT idea. Yeah. That I had. Yeah. yeah. What was yeah. your thought on that? Do you get where I'm going with that? Oh, that Google is not out of the game yet. So yeah, the Google Memo. Did, I thought they mentioned the Memo that they might be having a good a, a, an advantage of video, but they've got this massive video library thanks to YouTube, right? Correct. And so your idea was that um, they they're still in the game with AI if they play the cards right, and uh, because yeah, video GPT. Imagine like a large video model. So. I don't know. It's going to chew up a lot of electricity and servers and all that. But geez, probably head to speech. I mean, I don't know, but I'm I'm just thinking. I'm guessing. But anyway, um, if they can uh, get the GPUs and uh, you know be nice to the Taiwanese, get a decent price for their, <laughs> their chips, uh, yeah. then yeah. Um, then yeah, they could have a bit of a thing going, like you know, automated generated movies. Like you know, the next Avengers serial, there's like a million copies of it because everyone's got their own. Everyone's yeah, yeah. Take on the, yeah. Also, what I'm looking for is that, you know the greatest movie of all time, whose sequels totally sucked, but uh, you know the Matrix. 
yeah, people could make actual proper Matrix sequels. Yeah, yeah. But spin the story off correctly, you know. Uh, when you said greatest possible. greatest movie ever made and the sequel sucked, I assumed you meant Star Wars. Uh, oh, you did. Where, oh, where yeah. the but where the prequels were even better than the originals. Yeah, but the Star Wars just didn't have black leather. Uh, 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 dude was in white. It's all very traditional. But okay, Darth Vader was traditional. Had tons traditional of traditional golden age of sci-fi Star Wars. Yeah, okay. But the modern age, it was the Matrix, right? So, but yeah, what 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 is the thinking these days on the on the Star Wars sequels? Uh, are, are they actually standing the test of time, or are they sort of Disney sort of you know? kind of ruining a whole franchise yeah disney kind of ruined the whole franchise i, don't know. I think I don't know. uh but they they took a while to do it right so you may be yeah, right yeah. it was uh, a tremendous tremendous great uh initial movie the first the movie the, the first sequel was okay I, like the so the force awakens it was a movie right. there wasn't anything spectacular about it but it was not terrible um yeah but then yeah I, uh, I, I don't well, want I, 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 I don't want to get over that matrix reloaded not terrible either but, yeah but then it went but so uh, I, I don't anyway, uh, yeah half. yeah yeah Sorry, maybe, maybe that could be third hour it. yeah no no yeah maybe that can yeah. be uh, third hour discussion because it's yeah I don't know it's a big yeah, Star Wars it's a big Star Wars fan what, what you do I mean but I think you know I think you're right it's a potential there for um you know independent um creative people to to use these a video video ai tool to make a feature movie i, I don't think it'd be easy right so because you'd have to do a crazy amount of um tweaking editing and prompting to get things right and um you know getting getting the actors that you want and uh maybe also legal liability issues about uh-huh. using someone's someone's likeness on your own <laughs> yeah, so i'm not even i guess i'm not even crazy. i'm not even thinking movies right I, oh yeah I'm thinking. Yeah, what am I thinking? I'm I'm too narrow. I, I'm thinking There's all sorts of crazy options. I'm thinking like uh, like DIY repair stuff, right? I, I'm thinking, hey, I have a you know I have a 24 foot by 24 foot basement. I'd like to make you know I'd like to make you know, cut it in half and put up drywall, right? Yeah. Right. Right. You know, make me a video that shows me step by step everything I need. Video. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right? That's like directly applicable to your situation, right? You, you know, or right. you, you could right. even you could even load up a picture. You know, take a picture on your phone and say, "Hey, can you make a video that shows me everything I need to solve this problem?" Right? Or like, "Hey, this is." Yeah, you know, this is for severe ADHD people who can't read. Yeah, 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 yeah. like this is, uh, yeah. you know, my my sink is, is already... my sink is leaking. Here's a picture of my but, sink. But I don't want to read the Chat GPT solution. So could you please give Ex- me a video? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay, Google. You heard it here first. Yeah. For it. Yeah. A whole new era of how to do it videos. Oh wow! And here's the thing. Also, also, I'm looking for so science GPT was my idea. I had, I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I looked up a few science tools. Yeah. And they, you can get pa- paper summaries of scientific papers, but it's not, it's not all that great at the moment, and it doesn't do your research for you or you know generate hi- nice hypotheses. But science GPT could be a really good good one. You don't need the video on that because most scientists can still read. And um, the other one is um, like I want I want oh, comedy <laughs> I want I want comedy GPT. Mm. They have that. Uh, there was like a live there was a live stream that going on on uh, it was called it was like a Seinfeld uh, knockoff thing. It was all animated yeah. and it was like the Seinfeld. It was twenty four hour yeah. Seinfeld. So yeah, yeah. Interesting. But you had mentioned you had mentioned though the problem with the comedy, right? Is that it? Yeah. It only it, you know it's very selective in what it trains on. Yeah. 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 Um. Be that way. What was I? What was I going to say? Yeah. I don't well, know. I don't know. It's like it's like with science GPT, um, you know, like curing cancer or think think of one of the big ones that benefits society, right? Yeah. Um. Um. Do we have 
the knowledge to cure can to cure some 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 forms of cancer already implicit in past human understanding and no one's kind of put it together now oh that's interesting i, I know a bit, okay. about, a bit of biology yeah and it's probably not the that's case that's interesting but yeah, yeah, yeah it's like maybe it is the case yeah I don't know. yeah yeah it's like because because biology is tricky because it's like a whole lot of standard techniques and things and you sort of know uh kind of what's going on but maybe there's a little thing that that is just oh we, if we just synthesize this kind of protein or this yes. thing yeah we could knock knock out this particular cancer and then sort of you know just go down the chain do do one cancer type at a time because because you know cancer is one of those diseases that's unfortunately not a single thing it's all sorts of mutations and stuff because like uh type. the analogy would be the analogy would be like um you you have all the ingredients for a recipe. You just don't know what order yeah, to mix the them analogy. up in, right? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we've got all you the know, we've got we, all the ingredients. We just yeah. we just put, need AI to tell us. Right. Yeah, yeah. You put all the collective human knowledge together, and you can make like uh, you know an espresso that is like you know addictive. So you, you start drinking it, you'll never stop drinking it. It just triggers the right <laughs> right new yeah. response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the age of cancer. You, 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 we somewhat collectively, human knowledge knows how to cure. Say, I don't know, you know, prostate cancer, which is a nasty one, or yep. what's the, what's the worst on pancreas is really bad. Yeah, and and we just um, you know, it's all there, but the right proteins or the right the right agents haven't, yeah, just been uh, synthesized. Anyway, interesting idea. I'm mean, I'm pretty sure it's not the case, but you know, what if what if what if it exists to begin with? I, I really think this is probably where you and I would agree is I'll that is that it's not stuff like that is not going to be solved by gen, AGI, right? Like what what we need right. is to get into the hands of the experts narrow narrow AI tools, right? Um, the tools, yeah. And, and I'm thinking yeah. like uh, you know re reinforcement learning. I'm thinking you know kind of uh, autonomous bots that are not EGI, but have the ability to yeah. go do their own learning, right? To yeah. to, to try and come yeah. up with various hypotheses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My daughter's boyfriend is an immunologist. The, the PhDs are so disparate and despondent. They get all this training and stuff. And, you know, there's no job at the end of it. They, they, they're not being given jobs. And they could be because public funded research, could all, they could all be employed. It's so depressing. But, yeah. you know, their jobs day to day also, like, you know, take a rat, do something to the rat, you know, kill it, and then, sort of, you know, <laughs> yeah. mince, mince it up in the grinder. Yep. Will it blend? You know, st stuff like t tasks like that in the laboratories, in the bio biology laboratories, you know, could be, uh, you know, automated. And, yeah, we could have a lot of good AI, AI tools to make research better and, um but yeah, like like you say, yeah, just it, it's the exploration of the unknown, and uh, I think I think there's a lot in the past knowledge that that is there to synthesize into things that we don't know, but we sort of implicitly know them already. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I know in physics that's true. <laughs> oh God, I mean, every physicist knows this, right? So many problems that you could that if we had the proper tools for we could solve but this no one no one can actually uh, solve them currently because we don't have the tools but, um, oh yeah that's a good i know this is the th we're doing a third half in the first half whatever but, i'm um, having fun i'm having fun. <laughs> i don't i don't care yeah, it's a good yeah, it's a yeah. good recent lecture yeah. from the santa fe institute they invited john bayez he's um, the physicist who wrote this week's finds in mathematical physics for i don't know like six ten years or something for a while he sort of gave it gave that away and is doing other things but but it's an interesting thing on the future of physics so you know duck duck go for that one santa fe institute the future of physics has some really good really good stuff in it and um it talks about how you know fundamental physics he, he would he would advise young physicists like yeah don't go into that it's like there's no progress since the 1980s but there's heaps of really interesting stuff in in applied physics and um physics that uh, is in the interface with biology information science and so forth um but yeah i recommend that it's got it's got some really interesting takes on climate change and global warming and um all sorts of things come and ask them about ai a little bit
and uh, he's got a good. He's he's a good sort of just sensible guy. Does some good takes. He did. He did at one stage do do the whole sort of dis, despair thing. Like, oh yeah, well, if if artificial intelligence like takes takes over the show and humans are you know goners, then yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm like thinking, no, don't 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 go that direction. But he he, he was tempted, so he did. But uh, yeah. You know, it's a that's a that's a good one on the on the future of physics, but you could sort of just translate all of that to the future of biology as well. And um, I mean, if you, <laughs> I have to say, I have to say that if you understand MMT, right? If you understand MMT, then the future looks incredibly bright. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, so frustrating because scientists and an MMT. Are, I mean, you know, a money person, a finance person who's like, yeah, well, I can make money in MMT and the MMT. Oh, yeah, we could fix a few things, you know. Yeah. Unemployment can just go away. But, you know, if you're a scientist, it's even mad, more madder. It's like, oh, things we could be doing with all these bright people who have to take, you know, cruddy jobs and doing research for some sort of like petrochemical company or whatever. They could be instead doing what they really want to do in science, and you could have, you know, uh, almost like I want to. I don't want to say exactly, but you could almost have a sort of a new renaissance in science with um, with the way things are going. It does anyway. feel, I, man. It did. It feels that way. I, I get so discouraged. It is. Yeah. It, it's one of these things where it's like, uh, you know, from from curing cancer to even kind of more utopian ideas of just kind of. Uh, you know, uh, cracking open the the code to aging, right, and and maybe even starting to 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 de age yeah. or you know pause aging, right, all that sort of stuff, right. Yeah. Um, we it seems so close, and what it really seems like the problem is is not a problem of uh, a theoretical understanding or even not even a theoretical, uh, a, a, you know, a practical understanding of the chemistry and the biology, but it's it's really just down to. Uh, computing hours that kind of need to solve yeah. the problem, right? I, I mean, getting it's, rid of the bad tasks, yeah, yeah, speeding up the, yeah. the nasty tasks that a yeah. scientist has to do currently. Um, you know, it wastes a lot of time. You give people, scientists, and that a more artistic appreciation of their profession. They can be more creative. They can test hypotheses. Um, if they've got a lot of automation tools, you can sort of get things to run. Instead of like the current craziness, like there's a um, uh, there's a YouTuber who, who's into, who's a, I, I think I'd describe her as a tech optimist. And, you know, they don't program, but they, they test out um, the AI tools in, in a way that I, I never have the time to do. But it's like crazy stuff. They're actually, you know, letting the AI basically own their computer and, like, they can take, go and get it to autonomously sort of make you know what twenty thousand dollars in a week for them so one, yeah. one of one of them was was getting the ai to run their bank accounts and things for a week <laughs> that's and i was funny. like god oh, that's insane it's yeah. like you don't yeah. know what you're doing yeah they, they, they got to listen to richard storman you, you got to protect protect your computer there's all sorts of information on there you don't want some autonomous agent you know uh messing with I mean, you, you don't know what it's doing necessarily to to your files on your computer. And um, I, I, I swear, God, officer, it, it wasn't crazy. me. It was my autonomous yeah, yeah. Uh, AI agent. I know. <laughs> I know. I don't think enough people have been burned by that yet because it's early days. But, geez, I, I'm kind of a bit uh, worried about some people just, oh, yeah, I'll, too, I'll just push this button on the AI tool. It's like, yeah, it's not going to call Skynet, but you know, your bank account might go up by twenty, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, all of a sudden yeah. it's down by a hundred. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you just don't, don't do this, please, people. You know, protect your computer. It's about software freedom, the co computing and freedom, which Richard Stallman talks about a lot. If you're going to do something stupid like that, get an old laptop or something. You know, wall garden it so it doesn't have any of your personal data on it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, preferably use someone else's internet or something. But, but at least you know, <laughs> get your neighbor's Wi-Fi. Yeah. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stick, stick a you know, stick a virtual machine at least on it or something like that, so you can just tear it down anytime. And um, you know, compute in freedom and in safety is what I would say. Don't go on putting an autonomous agent as access to your computer on the internet. 
that you have no idea what it is doing and it's like you know just going around surfing internet without condoms sort of thing anyway tech optimists i guess you know crazy people but um well what what, what the point the point of that was what was that yeah they're doing they're doing all these playful thing things that i think is pretty <laughs> stupid but i guess they're having fun so i mean i won't begrudge them that um but but the science, yeah, the science, the creative people in science who, if they had these tools and if they yep. had the funding, yep. and you yep. can certainly 100% um, employ them in the public sector. I don't, I don't yeah. know what, I don't know what year, I forget the year that, uh, um, oh, JFK made a speech that, you know, we're going to go to the moon. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I equate curing of cancer, you know, so just some of the, some of the, some of the things that, you know, a generation or two after us will just take for granted, right? Like mm. that, that we, we know they're like, we knew whenever, whenever JFK gave that speech that it was mm. possible to put a man on the moon, right? Mm. It, it was just going to take a crap ton of science mm. to figure out how to get it all together. Right. So like, we, we know it's possible. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing that's not there we yeah. understand you know we yeah. yeah yeah exactly i mean we we understand the physics of it we understand all that you know but look there's radiation on the moon that you know that we don't mm. understand right you know you got to do it's just going to mm. take a ton of computing power in the meantime to mm. solve all of the problems that you just don't have an answer for like you know mm. there, there, there's an answer to all of them you just you just haven't solved yeah, each yeah. one of these problems um yeah and, orbital dynamics in that yeah and i, and I have I, to do it with like yeah and I feel like that that's where we're at today is it's like, look, we, we know there is a cure for yeah. cancer out there, right? I mean, we, we, yeah. we know it, it's theoretically possible to slow down aging, right? I mean, the, the, yeah. you know, there, there are certain biological and physiological functions or what, whatever else it might be, but yeah. <laughs> because there's not an MMT understanding, you know, we, we have people with PhDs that are flipping cheeseburgers, right? Like yeah, I, yeah. I, I just, it yeah, is, it, yeah. it is, it is just asinine, um, that we decide that we need a bumper stock of unemployed people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, anyway, I, I've gone down. I've, I've, anyway. Um, <laughs> I always thought nanobots would like be the ones that it's like, it's like you brute force the solution in biology. Uh, you know, don't have the reagents, not sure about the drugs. Uh, nanobot. <laughs> Get it. Nanobots will do everything. I know, you, you have to make them sort of, uh, you know, lifespan limited so they self-destruct. Otherwise, you know, you get that whole nanobot uh, science fiction story happening, I suppose. Not really, but I'm just dreaming. Nanobots. Yeah, I thought, because I, in radio, I had some, I used to work close to in the medical physics people with the radiation therapy and i always thought oh jesus this is so like clunky you know have a um you know you've got an, a, an electron beam or a x-ray beam or something that's just high powered so it's uh doing this you know you have a treatment plan that just heats up your body but just just zaps the cancer spot if you get it right you know instead of yeah. frying the person's uh other innards or whatever <laughs> And it's like, oh, this is this is really gross. This is really sort of uh, caveman type cancer treatment. And you know, you guys should just be going more into biophysics and getting the nanobots to to do it for to you. To do it, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I like was, I like the idea. The, the, the biologists didn't like that idea. That the physicists around us, uh, they thought, yeah, yeah, let's do that. But again, that's. Uh, <sighs> Well, I think bec- I think problems are not there. I think when the leading Republican uh, in the United States of America is currently asking to cut welfare spending on the poorest among us, yeah, I think clearly there's not a political will right now to yeah. uh, to get there. Um, let's see, we're continuing to get people to uh, to kind of stroll on in here. So uh, if you are watching, I, I think our viewer count is low because I see more people chatting than I see saying our viewer count. So <laughs> let me know in chat if you're here. Uh, we will get uh, kind of displaying, or I do want to show off some things I've been working on. Uh, very soon, I, I guess we can kind of just go into that. Maybe actually, oh, where, where, yeah. where we where we could start. I, but before we even get into that, you know what I've been most curious about to ask you is. The, the Blair uh, the Blair fix <laughs> controversy oh, yeah. they, they would say controversy was it what hello Con- I I just responded to something because it came up in my Twitter controversy yeah oh was it a controversy 
I'm not aware of that. It's gone uh, I I um, responded probably like a Johnny come lately. Like okay, usually doing these things. I, I'm gonna. So, uh, but I got I got the notification because uh, Blair was complaining that Nassim Taleb, who's you know obviously yeah. heavy, heavy yeah. hitter, and um, in that space, he, you know, basically you know financial statistics and that. Um, he was saying, you know, ridiculing Blair for using an R squared of zero point two and claiming some sort of relationship between I think I think it was the murder rate and yep. Uh, yep. and an inequality. And yeah, you look at the data and it was just a blob of data, so there was no no linear model that fits that. And I don't know what he was thinking, but R squared of zero point two is like no information. It's like he's saying it's just random. But he, his paper was writing it. I mean, this is why, why I was a bit confused because his paper was writing it as if there was a relationship. And of course there is. <laughs> there freaking is a relationship between inequality and murder rates. But it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not a linear model. I would, I would start, for example, with the, the basic one, which is the population size. If, you, if your population size increases, there's a number of um, social... Uh, indicators and factors and things that scale super linearly so they go up um like a power law with your yeah, population yeah size. yeah the power population size to the power of 1.2 is an, often a, an exponent and so if you increase your population by two two times your crime rate will not go up by two times it'll go up by something like you know uh, oh okay okay point seven or whatever okay, it is okay yeah yeah, yeah. So, so you can't use a linear model for those sort of things. Yeah, but 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 there is a model there, so you could model that and then get an R squared value and so forth, and to or, or better, it's use you know um, time series and use or mutual information and other things, other metrics like that that are fair comparisons. Because if you don't, if you get an R squared below below zero point seven, roughly maybe below zero point six, you're basically saying, oh, there's no relationship. It's random. Um, because the R squared is a non-linear, non-linear yep, measure, yep. you have to get really close to zero point nine or one to for it to show anything to show um, that there's an, uh, yep. use, useful information. Yeah, to confer to um, in favor of your hypothesis or whatever, rather than just oh, I don't get any information out there uh, out of it. So R squared zero point two would say you know oh I don't really know this this, this isn't giving me there may or may not be something there. But the this yeah, yeah, this may or may not be yeah. If there exactly. is something there. It, the, yeah. the, you're, I mean, it, it, it might be the first step, but yeah, if, if you're going to prove something, it yeah, probably doesn't yeah. hurt to run a linear model to find out one way or another, but. Well, I just use the interocular test. I just look at the data. And yeah. It looks okay. Linear. Okay. And, and, but firstly, you see the way I would do statistics is I, okay. Do you want me to do it on my uh, screen? On my yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can switch over. Yeah. 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 Switch up it work on that tablet and I'll just uh, make a new page here. Okay. Okay. So, so this is, this is what I'd say, say I'm, I'm interested in uh, an electric circuit here. Um, where I'm drawing. Okay. So there's a battery here and there's an electric circuit and uh, I've got a resistor and, and I want to say, okay, my voltage, is over here and my current is over here and i'm saying okay well i when i got zero current i got zero voltage uh data point <laughs> and then and then i say okay but um when i've got infinite infinite uh well yeah it's say like infinite current so I, I i'll just draw these axes so that it's like uh infinite goes off to infinity here some point here is infinity <laughs> scaling my axes so i could stick the infinite infinite infinity there and i say so okay well if it if I, I i could say if i've got infinite current i'll have an infinite voltage drop because you know the voltage drop is the energy per unit charge and so it's going to just drop an infinite amount of energy across the circuit and then what's in between so in between i've got like um uh, you know, I could say, well, two points there, it's a line. Whoa. <laughs> but, huh. but I don't, I don't, because I, I don't know where the data is over here or here. You know, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it go it gets to infinity through a, um, you know, polynomial or something like that, you know, goes up like that. 
uh, quadratic, or maybe it goes as a um, you know exponential sort of goes along like this and whoosh, up like that, or you know maybe it does something else, it goes all over the place, but then eventually you know get to infinity. These these all get to get to infinity if you draw it correctly. Uh, they all shoot up to infinite infinite voltage, infinite current. So you know which is which is, which of them is which is it? And and of course, if you know a little bit of physics, you'll say, oh well, um, you know, actually, actually the model that, that I'm pretty sure because I studied a little bit of uh, re, you know co conduction of conduction of electricity through materials. I think it's you know a, a resistance times current. Well, it's a linear relationship. There, there's the y there's the constant there's the x and uh so now i've got a model but that's only a model you know uh i got to test it yeah so yep, i test yep. it and i make some measurements and then and then i've got the measurements and then i've got the model but my model is like uh v equals ir v equals ir i don't know what the r is so my model is all of these it's just like you know, and so I don't know which R I've got for like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing it on a particular metal, say like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, copper or something. So, you know, is this R of copper or is this R of co copper? Which which slope, of, which of these slopes is R of copper? They, they're all supposed to go through this origin here. Yeah, so, so, so that's the thing. You, you have a model in mind and then you... Um, Look at the data, and then if the data looks like it, look, looks like it's linear, and your model is linear, right? Then uh, you've got an R squared value that that makes some sense for a linear regression. But if you don't have a linear model, so if you have like, um, you know, uh, if you if you had you know v equals r i squared or something like that. Or uh, v equals r e e to the power of alpha i or something, then you wouldn't you know you'd you change the model you'd you'd regress on the square root of i or here the log of i or whatever, um, you know you'd do, you'd do, you'd use some other model so you wouldn't okay. use linear regression unless unless you changed variables and so forth. Um, but you know you don't you don't get that in the econometrics stuff. You sort of you you, you didn't have a model. Didn't have, didn't even start with a model of how the um, uh, murder rate scales. Uh, yeah. With okay. Okay. Inequality, and so it's like it's pointless to even bother with the linear regression unless, unless if you're doing the econometrics and you and you you know some econometrics, uh, uh, and you just actually see the data and it and it looks like it lines up in a straight line, and then then you can say. I can do an R, a, a linear regression on it, and then you've got um, you go backwards. You sort of go backwards, and you say, "Ah, oh, well, maybe maybe there's a linear model." Okay. Okay. V equals alpha x or something like that, and then then you sort of do whole, the whole thing that you, the physicists did in reverse. You say, "Ah, oh, okay. Well, the data seems to suggest a linear model. Now, what could that?" What could that linear model be? What what's causing? Uh, what's the cause okay, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, and that's it. That's your science. So the, the physicists do it the one way. Like you start with the model first, then you get the data. The data should line up, so then you can get the parameters for your model, and you can get an R squared, which tells you how good the fit is. But the economists are sort of doing it a little bit in reverse. They don't have a model. But if they got the data lining up in a roughly a straight line, then they so can they, do a linear okay. regression. Okay. And then they go backwards and say, ah, <laughs> well, okay, so I've got a linear model. What could possibly, what could possibly explain it? So it's kind of like a, uh, from from an economist standpoint, or when you're doing kind of the econometrics, we're kind of manually doing what something like that that Cindy model would do, but instead of Cindy. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah tr trying right to get there. the equation. Yeah. That would, I guess, trying to discover yeah. the uh, equation. The, the actual case. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so going blank. You've got the, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. But go then on. you've got what, what, is, what I was going to say is, you know, how on earth could the physicists get a kind of a voltage current relationship like this? Well, look at look at this one multiple. Ooh, that's, that's tricky. Well, what happens is the battery is, you know, the only way that could happen is panpsychism. 
right? So every little electron has its own little mind. So the voltage tells the voltage supply tells the electron, hey, go that way, right? And and the electron goes, yeah, I don't want to go that way. <laughs> that's how you get this voltage current relationship that goes like this panpsychism wow you really don't like the panpsychism uh, or panpsychic psychics yeah <laughs> then, then, you, then you get old uh you know you know uh joseph uh joseph faraday right comes along you know he's quite a handsome guy sort of you know uh you know quite quite decent uh, eyebrows and, and so forth <laughs> he, he comes along and he's like he's like hmm electron or battery electron you will go this way and so then the electron you know goes that way end of story nice nice <laughs> So uh, effectively, what you're trying to say is, an R square value as low as what he presented proves absolutely nothing. Yeah. If yeah, if the intention is to show that there is a linear model at the basis yeah, of that's right, that's right, income inequality. You do a linear yeah. regression. Yeah, the R squared is just a parameter that you is the difference between the model and the um and the data. But um, okay, okay. But if you got a linear regression, then yeah, people usually a lot of people who just use statistics, like you know, as an aside thing for their research, they're thinking they're thinking that they get a p value which says there's a significant difference of this, yep, whatever from whatever, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's some sort of significant relationship. But but I I I didn't I have to admit though I didn't read the whole. Whole, the whole control, paper, yeah, whole thread, uh, controversy yeah. thread. I, I read his website thing, and I okay, and I went through it, and and all the data looks looks okay. It's like you know, oh yeah, so he's showing there's some relationships between uh, murder rates or crime rates and and uh, inequality, and of course everyone knows what those relationships will be. I mean, everyone can, everyone will will agree with him on that, but what you don't want to do is. Get the get the statistics wrong so that people just start shouting at you just because yeah. just because you got the yeah 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 you know, why do that so, yeah. so if you don't have a linear if you don't have data that lines up along a line don't even bother with a linear regression or R squared just show them the data and say look see yeah you know, this is blob and you know some countries you know have really high murder rates and they have really high inequality uh, you know but others don't. But clearly, there's something. Clearly, that clearly there's a gap that opens up from low um, murder rates, low inequality, to high murder rates, high inequality. But all in between, there's all sorts of other things going on. So, yep, yep. So, yeah, just just don't uh, just don't don't do that R squared stuff. <laughs> Helpful. It was interesting that Nassim Taleb got on that radar screen, though. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there would be much uh, crossover, but I guess someone mentioned it, and yeah, yeah, you never know. Man, he was br- uh, to live was brutal. Uh, what do you? Fe- yeah, I imagine fettuccine brain or whatever he called him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one of his things. Let's use the statistics. Yeah, you get because he's he's been on it on it for other reason reasons because um he he you know got got really upset about people using it and. Um, bad medical research he calls it you know the p-value disease or whatever it is oh Overused yeah in medical research yeah. and stuff like that and yeah. but then covid came out when covid came along he was he was big on the whole uh covid medical medical research stuff and he, okay. he was just livid livid that people were denying the efficacy of vacuums or or um you know wearing masks and everything and because they, you know, people could point to studies where it's, oh, the masks are not effective, blah, blah, blah. The vaccines are not effective. And Taleb was, could just rip them apart. And he says, no, you, you're just misinterpreting the data. And and he had these big rants and, um, you know, but the anti-vaxxers and the anti-masks, we're not going to listen to him anyway. But but still, you know, he's, he's he has, you know, b- strong bullshit detectors for all that sort of bad use of statistics, which is, is really good. 
Yeah. Um, I still think, and I think I'd be willing to get into a uh, uh, the words. Shit, you're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> Ty, the words made it look blobby. Yeah, that was that was a bit uh, a, a grimace face. Um, yeah. What's I gonna say? <laughs> Yeah, thank thank you for that. That, that was helpful. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, thoughts there. Um, I, I thought that's that where you're going, but that was a good explanation. Um, speaking of models <laughs> that actually do work, speaking of models, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see this. Yeah, take it away. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. We're in the second hour now, so um, hold on a second. Uh, very i'm also yeah i'm really interested in which uh which physical flows and which time series you're you're using for the model oh no you know you know what yeah keep going because i've got to uh yeah because because the ones i want to do which are orthogonal to your type of to your um models or not exactly because i'm still going to use the uh some of the deep some of the neural networks to discover but, but yeah i um this is yeah, I'm just yeah, interested yeah, yeah. to see which yeah. which first flows you think are the most that the are the most informative got the most information because when we way back when we were doing the mutual information and so forth yeah 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 we were yeah. looking at and we, we figured you know some of them have pretty decent correlations and and mutual information with a bit of lag and so you know they they should be able to um carry information for the um movement in the prices yeah so yeah you know but but which ones and because because you were gonna last time you you told me what you're gonna do was just throw a whole lot of the match so i did oh yeah yeah so i did it was, <laughs> not, it was not the right approach i, I was kind of thinking <laughs> oh is that kind of just noise things up a bit and it did that's exactly that's exactly what played out that's oh, exactly what played out it, it couldn't figure out yeah, yeah, yeah. so oh, yeah. a couple things um i've put a lot of work into determining what features are best for choice <laughs> And right. how to, uh, yeah, feature engineering selection. So this is always mm. the difficult thing in terms of, um, <laughs> in terms of continuing to uh, kind of monetize what we do here. You know, what what are, what are the few things that I'm going to say are kind of you know the secret sauce. Um, I think in broad strokes, I, I don't have the research ready to show in terms of. The mutual information ultimately that I actually I, I I had made that decision a while back and then kind of picked back up the actual model building itself. Um, to for, for those of you tuning in, let me let me start back up again. Right, the the, the MMT base case, my, my MMT base case is that the, the S and P is effectively price. Like you can determine the price of the S and P based on. Uh, I would say the two major factors at, at any given time that are determining the price of the S and P uh, are going to be the uh, the fiscal spending and ultimately what's left over at the end of the day. So uh, you know the debt held by the private sector, right? Uh, and then also pri private debt as well, right? So those are going to be the two main factors that are going to determine the price of the S&P. And a couple months ago, we actually looked at this where I uh, divided those out of the price of the S&P. And you actually saw you know, the fiscal spending and the S&P is, is all but sideways um, when you isolate the fiscal spending and kind of take that out of the value of the S&P. So I mean, I, I think I have <laughs> both on theoretical grounds from an M&T perspective and observationally, I think you can make the case that <laughs> that I'm right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rehash that, right? Uh, but well, I can make the case, or I will. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 it, I'm sure I could. It, it is. Uh, I mean, I, look. Obviously, if you're convinced by the framework for analysis that is an MMT, then what I'm saying 
shouldn't be much of a stretch to follow, right? If you're not convinced, right, you're not right. convinced. And I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Go go to go tune into Larry Summers live stream. Um, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> if if you are convinced by just the MMT framework, what what I did is I, I took that framework. This, this is the exact same concept that I did uh, quite a few months ago now on uh, using the MMT uh, uh, sectoral balance flows to predict unemployment, right? So we found learning in that, yeah. right? Um, doing the same thing with the price of the S&P, but I have to be a little bit more careful, right? Because there's obviously more inputs to the S&P than there are, um, than there are uh, mm. unemployment. And the, the dynamics, yeah. I, think, I think, for unemployment might be a little bit more narrow, right? Uh, but by that, I mean... Yeah. Th- th- there's no agents that are that are actively trading unemployment, right? That, that you, you, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's not a that's not an um, emergent factor that's going to come out of <laughs> the employment level, right? Um, no, right. One's, no one's trying to game. I mean, we're all trying to get employed, right? Uh, yeah. But but no one's trying to game that system, yeah. right? Production and consumption, y- yeah. Behaviors don't change a hell of a lot, you know. So yeah, the um the the labor market is yeah is is a pretty yeah, I, th- I think I want to say it's a pretty simple market, but obviously it's not that simple. But yeah. correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Compared to, compared to yeah, Com- compared yeah. to trying to understand people where, making bids yes. and trading, yes, and this exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so you do have to be a little careful, and then I also say various macro regimes um, need to be understood as well uh, in trying to predict where a stock market might be at, like what the price of the S&P should be given the data, right? So that's another thing that uh, I, I was you know, trying to get this model to understand. So when it was all said and done, uh, I ended up with 40 unique features that included data from the uh, monthly treasury statement, so the, the fiscal spending. Mm. Um, it also contained data from... <clears throat> It also. Oh, you just, you just <laughs> muted. I did. You just muted I, it I did. Uh, I had to sneeze. Um, <laughs> Forty. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was watching. I was watching the YouTube live stream, so I didn't. Catch yeah, you'll, it. you'll you'll see that I. I yeah. Um, I also. Forty. Yeah. Forty individual features, which is down from like eighty three when I started off this project, and and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it, it decreased. Um, monthly treasury statement H dot eight. A handful of data series from the H.8 credit, uh, deposits, um, that sort of thing. A little bit of data from the, the what is effectively the H.4.1, which is the Fed balance sheet. Uh, I also have some inflation data in there, CPI and oil. And then I also have, I think I also put unemployment in there as well. And then I also have... Um, what else did I put in there? Did you have tax? Uh, yeah, tax? yeah, yeah. Yep, that was part of the that was part of the Treasury statement data. Okay. Um, there might, might have been a few other things as well that ultimately went in there. So one of the things that I did learn that I thought the deep learning model would want is like multiple versions of derivatives of all of these. Turns out it just becomes noise. It wants the actual level and the rate of change, and it's quite happy with that. And it can figure out the rest, <laughs> which is really spectacular. Uh, which is really yeah. spectacular. Uh, yeah. when, when you think about it, that really it, it can determine, it, it can figure out some of the functions that are operating, um, to kind of create right. the cycles that we observe. So yeah. 40 features into, and I, I can show the actual structure of the model itself. I reckon it depends on which, which, uh, type of neural net network you're doing. If it's, you're still doing an LSTM type of model, uh, that would make a lot of sense to me. I do, but, but, but if ahead. I was doing a qualitative, like you know, um, convolutional neural network or something like that, um, you know, maybe not new reentrant, but just a sort of a, more of a, um, uh, you know, what are they called? Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. The, the, I think we mentioned in the past. You know, there's, a, there's an entirely different way of doing these things where you don't think about the data or even as a time series but just like a picture yeah 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 and in that sense i think maybe um you could you you could you could actually use a lot more of that information so but but but, but yeah it makes sense that if your time series you're sort of having to cull it back otherwise it does get a bit noisy i i actually do both i build Ah, my convolutional layers that then feed into the lstm model 
Right. They then feed into right. a, a dense model that actually does the regression part. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the direct. Uh, yeah, I remember you doing both. Yeah. yeah. So I do yeah. use both, and pretty much. Um, so th this is one of the things that you end up kind of figuring out with deep learning. Uh, you can go bigger. You need to go bigger with more data, uh, but you run the risk of overfitting the bigger you mm. go, and mm. it is very hard to find once you get enough data and i would notice this like kind of with the derivative you know i mean i'm feeding it the exact same data just in derivative form right mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so it ends up just creating a noise and then what you end up finding is yeah. it's like okay i need 31 filters on layer one and i need 60 mm -hmm. filters on layer two but i need the kernel size to be seven right and so you end up like way over hyper tuning mm -hmm. uh yeah the or the way over tuning the hyper parameters to fit mm. your data so it can learn right <laughs> um and you change one thing and then it ends up what, what i just kind of call flatlining which is it just overfits to the point no, no more learning can take place um and so I, I wanted a model that's robust enough that it can learn kind of no matter what data i throw at it Right, like that. There's yeah. learn even if there's nothing to learn there. I still need it to uh -huh. learn, uh, but not so specific, not so specified that it only works with the data that I'm giving it. And if I give it any other data, it's just completely incapable of ever producing learning. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah. A, a relatively robust for the amount of data that I'm throwing at a model that is multiple layers of convolutional networks that feed into LSTMs. Yeah. So, going to the point of this model, right? The the, the idea really with this model was not so much can I predict some future price of the S&P. I have models that do that already. Uh, I'm going to continue to build models that, that maybe can improve upon what we already have. But what I was really trying to understand is, okay, given all this data, if, if I'm right about my, my uh, kind of MMT theory about where the price of the S&P is derived from, then I should be able to calculate, I, you know, there should be some equation out there that would be a fair market value of what the S&P is today, given all the flows that we've seen over some time period, whatever you want to, you know, whatever however long that time period is that you want to define and then given where any you know effectively where the stocks not the not the stock market stocks but the accumulation of the flow stock is actually at as well uh and that's what i wanted to you, you know f essentially figure out and go after because as a trader it would be nice to know is the market currently overpriced or is it underpriced relative to the data? Um, when would be good buying opportunities? When might be good selling opportunities? And match that with the other tools that I have, right? Just my own macro intuition, my other kind of predictive tools uh, effectively just kind of let me know where is this market relative to kind of where it should be given the history of the last you know 40 years of data that we have uh, that I can compute into this thing, where should this be priced? And then while you're at it, and I added some of these as well, um, make sure you understand different regimes that we're in as well. And you actually I, I, you actually see the model kind of figure out that there are different, this is, this is what's wild. You see the model figure out that there are different macro regimes. It doesn't exactly know how to deal with it, but I, I think there is uh, yeah. a glimpse of, it knows there are different macro regimes and it doesn't know how to kind of do the, you know, the fair market value pricing of it, given those regimes, uh, okay. which is kind of wild. So here's the actual predicted. Now, another thing you have to realize too, and I attempted to do this and it just didn't seem like, uh, I wanted to spend much more time than I, uh, than I did trying to get this to figure to get this right. But what I wanted to do is like give a real fair market value to the S and P, right? You know, the S and P should be valued at 4,295 right now, but it's at, uh, 4,150 right? The problem with deep learning is it really, really wants stationary data. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and, and it just, it, it always has a tough time scaling higher, right? It just doesn't understand that in the theory, the S and P can go to 50,000, right? right. <laughs> Cause the highest it's ever seen is whatever the highest print has ever been. And it, mm. it thinks that's a literally a one in a million shot of hitting that. Cause it's the only time it ever hit it. Right. Uh, right. so it, it does have issues. I tried different scalars and stuff, um, but it really struggled with data that wasn't stationary. So what I decided mm -hmm. to do is just do a one year return of the S and P, which for me is, is, is close enough, right? Um, what, what is the return okay. over the last year relative to where it should be? 
close enough. I know I could extrapolate that back out to a price, um, but there might be like rounding errors that would really throw it off and then kind of make it meaningless. So we are looking at price, uh, the, the return over one year for the S and P where it should be and where it actually is. So, uh, like I said, the models of CNN into an LSTM, here's the predicted price. And then here's the overlay with the predicted price in the actual S and P price. And I want to, I want to also put that out, put this out there. One of the features was not the price of the S and P. So exactly the same as what I did on employment. That is not a feature that it learns from. Now, obviously, it's its target, but it's not a feature that it's learning from. And so it, it doesn't get that as part of it as part of the training data set, right? Um, so, it, which is you know, part of just making this a, a more generalized learning model. Uh, everything left of the gray was test data. Everything right. I'm sorry. Everything left of the gray is training data everything to the right is test data where it didn't see the actual data and so as you can mm -hmm. see on the right side there it does a hell of a job understanding where mm -hmm. it should be at um which shouldn't be too much of a surprise if you're an mmt -er, right you would imagine a deep learning yeah. model like this yeah. should learn um how to come up with the right price given all the data that we threw at it which i would say is the most important data to to determine mm -hmm. what the price of the S and P should be, uh, given the various flows. So in my mind, a, a ton of success, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the outcome. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any questions right now, Bijou, as you're seeing this, what, what your thoughts are. Uh, no, it's a bit, Oh, this is not really any questions at the moment. It's good. It's good. It's fantastic. Actually. It's kind of, kind of, I guess, probably what i would have expected just look eyeballing that um looks like it's done a pretty decent job qualitatively but uh, just uh one question is um trying to see the resolution on it so yeah sorry if this isn't coming in i i yeah i i'm just i'm not quite i'm just can you go over again exactly what it's predicting? So if you start at the two at the twenty fifteen band there when you're in the um, yeah yeah uh, prediction regime, um, then all of the so so the next time step is what uh, did you say was it a month or a day? It's it's what the it's what the expected return is from the prior from where the price was the prior year so it's it's off oh, from the prior year so it's looking back yeah to 2014 which is yeah um, exactly exactly yeah scale okay i got it yeah yeah so essentially yeah. you know for the prior year you know the s p is up whatever 10 percent or whatever it might be i, I mean i don't know the exact number right but yeah. uh, effectively right and so my, the my, data, but the data it's using is all the way up to 2015. Yeah, yeah. My, and then the next, the next point look is is looking at the what the change in price from a year uh, ago. Twelve months. Yeah, ago. yeah. Got it. And so the so then, in that case, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Keep going. Keep going. So in that case, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to um, be you know super well fitting the actuals, but I would expect is some qualitative features which is exactly what it looks like although uh yeah so it, it, yeah so she's sort of just like drunkenly sort of tried to follow the blue line you might get something like orange right that's what i'm thinking it's like qualitatively actually doing a pretty good job yes um and uh yeah so the other question is is uh you think that's this is useful stuff to uh continue looking at yeah yeah for me this this is a production model at this point so here's the actual production model yeah. right um right. which is just simply saying that we're slightly on you know given all the data that we have we're slightly underpriced right yeah and so for me during the updates and and my, you know my own research i would just simply say yeah it makes sense that maybe using everything else assuming we can get through the debt ceiling stuff it makes sense that we push up to 4500 here right like we're, we're not overpriced yeah. by any stretch um right. i i think we're close to being priced at at a, at a fair value here and uh there's definitely room to grow given the flows right uh right. you know the predictive models are still saying that you know there should be growth into the future and if anything i, I mean we should see just kind of the way that that 
kind of boom and bust cycles happen, we should maybe get to a, a bit of an overextended period, you know, before we have a, a, a pause and, and come back down. So yeah, that, that is, I mean, again, in, in conjunction with the other models, you know, Hey, are we, are we priced properly right now? Ooh. I really think we're so just, skipping, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So it's really, um, and, and again, just to re to, to emphasize that, or to reiterate that it's looking at the, what you think the fair price is today. Correct. So it's not, we're, Correct. Not, we're not forecasting. Correct. Yep. We're yep. looking back and, and we're saying, uh, MMT fiscal flows are, you know, telling us what the pro fair price today should be based on a year ago. Yep. Um, yeah, good. I think, I think also one other comment would be the way I think it, we, when you were reading that paper on combining the, um, CNN with the LSTM, did you, did you sort of read that as like the CNN is kind of like doing some sort of data smoothing going <laughs> yeah, on? It does. Is yeah. It, is that what you were thinking? Uh, I, thinking. I, I think what the CNN is doing I mean, I, I hate to anthropomorphize. Uh, yeah, I know. this this I, bad, but I, I, I really think what the C, what it, what the CNN is is doing is it's doing kind of what we do, where we look at something and say, "Hey, that's the cycle," right? Right. Right. Because uh, one of the things, like, uh, just, you can't you can't know that we we can't correct. know exactly what it's doing. So I'm I'm just thinking maybe it's quasi what it is sort of effectively doing. And it, it seems like it's a necessary step, especially when you know you're dealing with nonlinear systems. Mm. Um, yeah. Because it gives it the ability to understand, really, I guess it would be more the, the, as opposed to the quantitative, the qualitative look of the system. Yeah. So it can deal with, yeah. you know, it can deal with that data. Yeah. And and it is it is very true that the CNN helps. I mean, giving it a... <laughs> giving it a picture to look at <laughs> over yeah. over just raw data helps it yeah. tremendously learn yeah here's really one of the cool takeaways that i, I want to share too um and that is going to be <laughs> notice how <laughs> up to 2000 the model constantly under predicts you can see the prediction coming short of price during the the aught years the 2000s it sticks pretty darn close to price. And then finally in the predictive realm, starting about 20, mm. you know, post great financial right. crisis, it starts to over predict. And you can even see uh -huh. that here. Yeah. And, and I think that has to do with the fact that it's understanding the various macro regimes that, that the data is in. Um, <laughs> and that it's kind of trying to, it's trying to compensate right. over time for the shift in the macro regimes. Cause I did give it some of the data that it would understand that, um, there's a, a you know, a, a change in reserve balances and a change in the way that the fed is operating. Mm. And right. I think it, it at least understood that there was that change that was occurring, um, through, you know, kind of the dot com boom and then post great financial crisis. So uh, again, it's kind of like a, well, it's not like it understood it. It's like it um, it affected it. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It affected it. Cause, yeah, that's interesting. So, so what you want to do is just become Supreme Lord Dictator Douglas again, and then just willy nilly like change the regimes, and then yeah, then you'll know, yeah. you know, and then yeah, you'll be able to see, oh yeah, yeah. that's yeah. just my model. Sorry, everyone, to mess up the economy for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about to, yeah, we're about to mess up the economy and find out, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Big anyway, these disaster experiments. It's live. It's production. Uh, okay. uh, it's what I'm using on the, you know, on the Patreon feed. Is is kind of part of, the, you know, put it in the toolkit and uh, kind of happy to have a, a, a live deep learning model. But um, that's one of the things I've been working on. So, yeah. Yeah, well done. Uh, yeah, that's great. Did that does that did that lead into you what you wanted to say about um, your interest rate effects and things like that? Yeah, we can we can definitely uh, change Probably course now. Topic. This is a completely different topic. This is me just uh, thinking through some of the some of the thoughts that I had while I was listening to the Applied MMT podcast. Uh, right. Okay. So okay, just reset for that then. Unless yeah. anyone in the chat. I don't, if, it, if you sort of stunned everyone in the chat, 
I, I don't. I, I, we're actually. <laughs> I, 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 we, we've been we've been kind of low on viewers tonight. I don't know if it's uh, just uh, people okay. get, getting out early for Labor Day weekend. I guess that would only be the the, the Americans that uh, that are out here. They're just enjoying their summer. It'd be kind of interesting yeah. to see uh, long term what the uh, what the cycle is of viewership over the year. Um, I know you're gearing up not for summer but for winter. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty cold here. Um, okay. Oh well. As long as as long as our viewer numbers are low, let's just bombard them with more math again. <laughs> <laughs> so Hadn't had enough. Come back for more. This is uh. Well, it's graphical. This is endogenous money system. Yeah, endogenous money system. So one of the one of the discussions we had last week um, was about interest rates and the impact on the macro economy. And if at any point would an interest rate be high enough that it could finally tip the scale. And I, and I tried to explain, yeah. and I don't think I was explaining it well enough, um, that if if our intuitions are correct and, and the, in terms of how, I'm going to call it the, the Mosler MMT view of interest rates, um, that I actually think that it's going to be the deceleration of interest rates going higher that could actually prick the bubble, right? So I, I, mm. I mean, I think you can kind of make a case for that. But in order to get there, you first need to kind of make the case that interest rates uh, kind of drive at the aggregate level the, the macro economy. And I, I think the key part of this... Um, <laughs> Hey, what up, Jesus? Welcome, man. Jesus. Welcome, man. Uh, yeah, I saw your Chris Christie comment on the God, that was great. Podcast. That was great. Hey, that was hilarious. Yeah. Um, you would also need to make the case that, uh, and this will tie back into the, excuse me, the endogenous money cycle here in just a second. But you mm. need to make the case that loans will actually increase in a higher interest rate environment, right? And that uh, you're not going to necessarily deal with a, a slowdown in the repayment. Uh, or I'm sorry, an yeah. increase in the repayment of, of, of those loans. So if you can get through right. that, then you can make the case yeah. that higher interest rates are at best neutral to the endogenous money cycle. But yeah. potentially... Um, could potentially kind of, kind of like, yeah. you know, mortgage loans are a different thing to like people using their credit card. People have to have to use a credit card, which is essentially a loan. It's credit. Yeah. Money, yeah. Just to get through, you know, every week to week. If they, yeah, if they're tapped out of income. So yeah. The, the astounding thing to me is that the, the mortgage loans haven't, haven't dropped off yet. So, you know, what's going on there? Um, oh, that's one area where I would, would have thought that, you know, um, Mortgage payments might have, you know, gotten into a bit of trouble, but yeah, maybe not. Because the higher interest rates might have affected them. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just one area where I thought that there might have been a bit of an yeah. effect. Okay. Because you don't have the same balance and dynamic between savers and borrowers, borrowers in the in the mortgage market. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know a lot about mortgage market side of things excuse me guys sorry about the constant breaks there so my my, my thought was while i was listening to the applied mmt podcast is, is one of the things they brought up is that um it, it was it was a good kind of walk through how the banking system works and and because ryan is, is so intimately Involved on that aspect, I, I you know I kind of trust his take here, right? But we know that banks are massive holders of treasuries, right? And it, it fills right. up a huge part of their balance sheet. And the transmission then, and, and how this would work, is that the banks get the interest payments on those treasuries, right? And and this right. is this is one of the things guys apply to MT if if you guys hear this and and can make sure I'm I'm right in this thinking, let me know. Um, but they, they get that interest. And I, th I mean, I know a part that, that is definitely happening is that, that essentially um, increases their capital ratio, right? So right. Th that, 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 that it builds their equity capital, pushes their capital ratio higher, and by doing so gives them more space to grow their balance sheet. So they are now incentive, they now have right. ca capacity to grow their balance sheet. 
yeah. um, given the fact that, that the, the, the capital ratio is higher and, and that the equity kind of that, that equity base is growing right. as well. So I, I would say that there is at least a direct connection that would encourage or at least uh, not encourage, but at least uh, be, be a point towards the, the the fact that interest rates are actually going to maybe spur on the endogenous money cycle. Okay. Well, okay. What it, so what it does is that, I mean, I, I don't know how, um, how Ty build that model exactly. Yeah. If it's similar to, to, to can, Steve's models. That, I can, I can restart it and let it, let it start to run here a little bit. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not sure if it, this uh, is Steve's would, model. Would yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's godly, godly table. So everything's nice and, um, yep. you know, balanced as far as the accounting goes. But th- I, was, I was thinking is that, um, you know, a bank, a bank doesn't just look at their capital adequacy ratios and so forth and say, oh yeah, we've got, we've got heaps of space to make loans, maybe even some, you know, dodgy ones because they still got to find a credit worthy borrower Correct. unless yep. they cook yep. the books. Yeah. and do a you know ninja type loan and stuff so i think um because because we had 2008 there was a lot of you know crackdown on the uh, fraudulent loan um industry and although although that might have ramped up in recent years a little bit perhaps i don't i don't think it's reached the same levels and so it's still it's still an issue to find a, a credit worthy uh, customer to to actually give the money to so even though they've got like you say they can expand their balance sheet. And they've got the space for it. And it's not necessarily that they're going to be able to find people who a credit worthy person. Yeah, 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 worthy person. Yeah, and so that's where the trickle down effect comes in. So the Correct. interest income yeah. is giving others also uh, more interest income at the top end of town. But is that where the well, you know, it's just it's just the unknowns. Is that where the banks are getting their main customers from, so they can then issue credit to those people who are already getting. And I, I don't know. I don't think it works. You know, cause people who need the money are people who don't have the money. <laughs> so, I so, so I, I have some thoughts on this. One, I think we're definitely seeing this dynamic play out where um, everyone is noticing higher prices, right? And, and right. let's see, let's even just for a second set aside the argument of of the inflation that we've seen, right? And, and let's just. I, I'm not going to debate the anti MM tiers. We're just going to say that we know <laughs> that the higher interest rates do push the 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 price structure higher, right? The term structure yep. price is higher, right? right? And that that's observed, Absolutely. and that's observed by everybody yeah. at, at all times. Even in recent mainstream paper, actually, they've come around to thinking to, to recognizing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, at least one of them. It's like one among he, many is gets drowned out, but yeah. And so I, I guess the thing would be like the business person knows that, hey, if the interest rate is at 10 percent, right, you, you know, my, my borrowing, the, the total amount of income that I'm going to need to pay employees for the next 10 years or whatever, whatever that whatever that, you know, whatever amount of borrowing I'm going to need, right. I'm going to multiply that by the 10 percent interest rate. Right. right. Um, so so you, you have that avenue. Right. And even just the person living will see the cost to borrow for a mortgage, right? Or whatever, whatever it is that that, that mm-hmm. might get priced in through that kind of financial, you know, that financialized line, right? Mm-hmm. Um and so they all see that and then they they begin to immediately demand a higher wage because of it. And mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and and that that part is I think would require evidence, but I think the evidence is there. Right. That I mean, that well, we're, it's not. We're, it's not really well lubricated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of friction on the wages, but yeah, I think that's the dynamic that would. I think that's the dynamic that works. Yeah. Um. So if that's the case, hey, Zeus, good question. I don't have the answer, but we can discuss it. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll definitely get back to that in just a second. So my my thought is, if if there is that, um. If 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 in fact there is uh, I don't know what to call it, like a, a labor <laughs> a labor demand uh, for the you, you know for, for for the trickle down effect, um, th- then I think this is how that money gets removed from those who would generally have a higher propensity to save, right? Because they have to, otherwise their employees will go elsewhere, right. and right. that income is available. Whether it yep. be 
directly from companies that you know might have a higher mm-hmm. income stream from cash that they're holding, right? Mm-hmm. Or um, it would be to companies who are borrowing, right? Because now the banks are incentivized or have a, the capacity and the incentive to create new loans, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that the banks are, are going to be a little bit more eager to go ahead and give those loans out because they want to get their capital ratios lower to increase their profits, right? Uh, the the right. banks to do so. So I, I think so that, there's, I the think cycle that exactly right. That's exactly what I've been thinking, how the trickle down is working. And okay. I, th- I think to complete the cycle though, the higher wage then has to get spent and you know, it will get spent. <laughs> to, to, yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> it's got some prices yeah. Have gone up. Yes, it will get spent. Yeah. And it, and then this creates the, the, the hot, the hot dollar effect where you just don't want to exactly. hold on. You don't want to be holding right. on to your dollars, right? Yeah. You, you want yeah. to buy anything that might either appreciate with, um, yeah. you, you know, with the hot market. Um, it, it is what's, what's interesting is obviously we're in a world where we still have inflationary effects from COVID and then a war, right? Right. Um, but, but if, 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 if for some reason we had the COVID spending without the global shutdown and then a war, right. I, I think by now inflation would be leveling out. Right. Yeah. And then we could be running a different experiment, but it's the experiment we have. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's experiment we got. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's, uh, it. That's the economics. So, yeah. Oh, so, I think, I'm, I think I'm on the board with this story. Okay. The thing so, is like, you know, code GPT now, uh, give me the, the Minsky model for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here, here, and here's here's why I asked for the Minsky model. So uh, Ty was nice enough to hand this off, and um, here's you know kind of why I wanted the Minsky model to, to show this. I'm going to start speeding up the simulation, right? So we're now just looking at the endogenous money cycle, right? Which, um, just to give the caveat here, any negative effect that the endogenous cycle could cause can always be offset by, you know, the, the Mosler rule, right? That we, we can always spend ourselves out of a recession, right? Um, we, we don't have to have an economic collapse. But that that aside, assuming we don't have a government that's going to get on top of it, you do still have potential negative effects from the endogenous cycle. And according to the way that this gets set up, is it, it's, you know, one of two ways that this is going to happen. Uh, for this, years for one repayment to have the debt, right? So if I pull this lower, that means that it's um, that will kind of crash growth because it's taking mm-hmm. – uh, yeah, we got some Minsky, Ty. Welcome back, man. Uh, when we pull the, the years for repayment to have the debt, we're slowing down the um, – no, we're increasing <laughs> the repayment speed of the debt, right? When we mm. go the when we go the opposite rate, uh, and we say it takes longer time to pay back the debt, then that is going to, uh, yeah, that's going to be the the slowing of the repayment, right? So the dial's backwards, but I hope that makes sense. Uh, if we put that back at kind of the starting level nine, we'll we'll find our steady growth. On the flip side, this gets a little bit more intuitive. Um, years for lending to double. So again, if, if we pull this thing lower, right? So now it's going to be fewer years that it's going to take to double the debt rate, which means we have more lending going out. So I would say like this is what we're experiencing right now, right? We're, we're effectively seeing a hot economy because mm-hmm. the interest rate is pushing higher, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we slow it down. And, and this is where I think, again, I think most people would say, hey, if you increase interest rates, what's actually going to happen is lending is going to slow down. But I think the, the case we just made is no, actually lending is going to speed up um, mm-hmm. in, in that scenario. So uh, it and continue to speed up. So th- that is the Minsky dynamic that is at play, and and I I, I mean I still don't <laughs> I still don't know if I've connected all the dots, but I, I think I'm pretty darn close, um, or I like to think I am, and so th- this is why I think I'm gonna go ahead and set this back to <laughs> equilibrium, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. to wherever the actual starting point was at. So this is where I'm just going to kind of spitball and kind of be a, a, a I don't know, it's not controversial, but um, and, and and again, if if anyone has some insight into if this is really how banks 
uh, end up operating and how their balance sheets end up playing out. But to, to now say, my concern is, is if they actually start to bring rates lower, right, that reverses course all the dynamics that we were just talking about. Yeah. And so what is that, what is that going to do? Well, immediately, if the market thinks that the Fed is going to, uh, that they hike uh, uh, rates at, right, then bonds will start to push back up in price. And what that immediately does is that increases the value of their assets, right? Because they hold the bonds mm-hmm. as an asset, which affects their capital structure, right? Mm-hmm. So now they have less space to continue to create those new loans, right? So they're less incentivized to create the loans because the interest rate is going down. They are now also receiving less capital than they were prior, right? They're, they're getting the, 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 the capital buffer is slowing down, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. And what I think kind of what Minsky taught us is that, and, and this is what my this is what my concern is, and, and I get the math behind it too, and we can go into that in just a second, but my concern is that even leveling out the rate of change at which the interest rate is, is changing can be enough to affect the system negatively, mm-hmm. right? To essentially start to slow down lending mm-hmm. that it, you know, pricks the bubble, right? Um, and, and decreases growth. And yeah. I think the, the mechanism to do that is what I just explained, that the, 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 the transmission through the banking sector, uh, cause it's now kind of the opposite of what we're seeing. So there's kind of my, there's kind of my mm-hmm. argument, um, kind of how I see it. I don't know if that tracked yeah. <laughs> fully, but, uh, yeah, yeah well, maybe I'd have to go, go back and go through it again on, on the, the changes okay. that you made on okay. the model and to look at the reactions. But yeah, I think, I think, I think you got that right. Um, well, I mean, I agree with, I agree with that. And it's good to it's good to see that a you know, stock flow consistent model kind of basically uh, illustrates a lot of what all of those dynamics, which is you know, <laughs> it's what it's what mainstream economists don't have. I, I was looking, I was looking. It's interesting though because I was looking the other day at um, at that inflation, that look at inflation that the Gordon and Clark guys did from yeah. I can I can switch over to your Cleveland, screen real quick. Cleveland Fed. Yeah, and um, and just it's just interesting to compare because they're using uh, you know, vector auto regression models, which are really sort of just dumb econometrics models. You you sort of apply a shock, and your you know previous uh, uh, parameter fitting to the previous prior data just tells you you know given a certain impulse or shock. What's going? To, what's the response going to be in the um, variables? And uh, it's just like compared to the Minsky model, it's just really kind of I don't know. I don't know what to call it. It's just really dumb. It's, <laughs> lax, really, it's lax, really just lax. Very uh, yeah. Very very uninformative. In, inadequate. What a, what a, <laughs> in, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a bit tired, so I'm not in a good enough mood to think of some really crazy, really, really good, uh, really good jokes for it. But yeah, yeah, just. Yeah, inadequate. It's like a, uh, it's like you go out on a date and like you know they're not, they're just not talking at all, and so you don't know whether they like you or not. They don't know whether like you they, yeah. they like yeah, you or yeah. hate you. Yeah, like, eh. yeah, yeah. It's like okay, want to yeah. go another date? Yeah, tomorrow, <laughs> next week. I don't know. Yeah, maybe give me a call. Yeah. So, so this is what these vector <laughs> order regression models do. But but the one, I mean, the one interesting thing is that they. They at least do show impulse on the um, response to the price level to supply shocks, which is quite strong, and um, and the response to demand shocks is pretty pretty weak. You don't get much of an increase in inflation from demand. Oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 yeah. So I mean, although although you know, I I would much prefer to look at the outcomes from a Minsky model it just gives you a better um, qualitative view of view of things. But th- these, this paper was nevertheless pretty interesting. Um, and what I guess I want to show, so they have a decomposition of the inflation. You can see the demand yeah. shots were not, were not uh, you know, really big 
factor, although they were above, they were into the positive for the period from 2020 to 2022. But you see quite a quite a bit of green there. That's the supply shocks. Uh, if you're not colorblind, if you can see the screen there. And then uh, do another series before the COVID, and you can see the demand is often quite negative there. So uh, demand shocks were in the negative, right? And I, I don't know what that what that means. I guess it was a withdrawal of demand was causing prices to go down. I think that's the story there. And then they redo the 2020 to 2022 series and they just changed a couple of them from, um, what was it, previously financial shocks in blue. They changed to cost push shocks, which they call call cost push shocks, which is interesting because the cost push wasn't, it doesn't look quite as big as financial shocks and other factors. But it, again, you can see in purple, the supply chain shocks were, were pretty dominant, quite dominant. And the demand shocks, uh, not not so great. You can see, if I show around March 20, was the big the big dip in prices from like lockdowns, I guess. It's a big drop in demand, which then you know recovered. And um, yeah, it's an interesting story. So it's interesting that, that they're actually getting a better grip on inflation. They they understand that maybe the interest rates do have an effect too, but but that, like I said, that model is not it, it, the way they construct those models. I just looking at the past data, applying a little impulse, seeing what happens. That's what vector auto regression is, and um, and also they have to have a lot of assumptions that they build into their models. So it's a, a lot of neoclassical or New Keynesian type assumptions, and so you got to take take that with a grain of salt. So if you look at that data and just look at the interest rate shocks it's it's not guaranteed that they that they're getting it right so um that's why i would i would prefer to look at a minsky model to see uh what the what the effect of interest rates is because these models are not really dynamical models yeah yeah they're not really yeah they're not truly uh looking at the actual effect of interest rates on the on all of the uh dynamics it, it is interesting it, it is always a little sad whenever you look at uh, charts and data and models that are coming from what, what should be the, the absolute, uh, you know, cutting edge research. Yeah, cutting the, edge, bleeding edge research, and it's it's the PhDs there. It's yeah. barely better looking than an Excel chart, right? Like I just like, like what, uh, what, yeah, okay, yeah. You made a bar chart. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I know that's just the way that data is going to be displayed, but it does seem like. Um, it could be a little bit more bleeding edge, showing something a little bit more. <laughs> uh, yeah, they just—they're not using the right tools. Tools, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, what can you do? Th this is the one. Uh, Bernanke was—he was on this paper, right? Was this the one? I saw some headlines about. Uh, oh, some... this is by Gordon and Clark. Oh, okay. I didn't see Bernanke's name. Bernanke's name. Okay. Yeah, there might have been. There were a couple of papers that came out. Okay. Uh, analyzing the. Um, decomposition of the current inflation price changes and all that but yeah yeah i didn't i didn't have time to read to read all of them just just a look, quick look at this one because it was highlighted by someone and uh, got some interesting comments yeah um the other thing of course was the oil prices that that there was an interesting little comment about that um so if you if you hear if you hear someone from the mainstream try to try to argue oh the oil prices they don't they don't really track inflation um, yeah you got to you got to point yeah. out to them that that the oil oil price shocks aren't inflationary really so you could sort of agree with them this, this, is, this is how you got to tackle these these kind of trolls you got to say well you sort of agree with them because the oil price is being set by a monopolist essentially. So when they decide, oh, okay, they had a bad day at the casino, you know, as as Warren would often say, they, they might just decide, you know, go to a meeting at the palace, OPEC meeting at the palace next week. Oh, the oil price has gone up for some reason, right? And so, uh, so it's a one-off adjustment because that will pass through 
to most countries because we're all dependent on oil and energy drives the economy so that will pass through into uh, higher general prices but it's not inflation <laughs> it's a one-off change in the price yes level. in the price level yep yep it's not not yep. what we call inflation yep so if you did an Aminsky model you'd see a you'd see a blip and um those those vector auto regression models would also sort of see a blip and they'd sort of then try to extrapolate it in a sort of stupid way but you know that's what it would be it would just be a a result a long-term result of a sort of a blip and they would call that they'd probably call that inflationary but it's not it's just a one-off change in the prices due to just one monopolist setting the price if they continuously raise the price of oil then you'd see then you could call it inflation but uh, it's of a different nature whereas the interest rate well it's kind of like a monopolist also setting price isn't it it's like the central bank yeah monopoly yeah. on city the interest rate floor they're, they're setting the price of the currency their own price but the diff the difference there is that the interest rate is um a cont uh, creates a continuous increase in the price level yeah. they're not just saying oh let's hike the interest rate 10 percent today they're, they're saying uh the, the interest rate is going to 10 percent uh until we decide not it's just so, so when they do that every day they're setting their their price changing yeah. the, price, the yeah, currency some... and essentially 10 percent more than the next day yeah or at least you know whatever annual adjustment yeah so um that's why the interest rate really is an, an inflation rate whereas the oil price um shocks or gouging is not it's not really inflationary it's a one-off change in the price level interest just have that in mind if you get people who are kind of being no it's helpful and, yeah it's helpful yeah trying to trying to say mt is wrong because <laughs> because you know a lot, a lot of the na naive mmts will will sort of get scratched their head and say oh you know but but you know the the oil prices should be causing inflation not really no only if they keep going up yeah yeah <laughs> which we might end up seeing i still think we're going to start yeah. seeing uh, kind right. of a, a price gouge so all, all of these things all of the stuff coming together like this bit of a storm happening with the debt ceiling mm -hmm. maybe interest rate um gets pulled down a little bit and if there's no uh government spending fiscal injection to make up for that um and and it looks like that will be the case too right so we're going to have a triple shock because because there'll be I mean, I guess the two two of the shocks are going to merge into one, right? Because the debt ceiling really just merges into um, spend, spending cuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you could say that, but but if it, if it was a triple shock, like if it was a debt ceiling, uh, you know, stopping the payments and the spending cuts at the same time, which kind of go together. But but imagine if they were sort of compounded yeah and the interest rates yeah yeah <laughs> stop injecting money into currency <sighs> then then I, then I think you get the normanator bijou crisis and uh it all becomes just blatantly clear you know how things work and uh we never ever have this mess ever happen again nope no nope. we would have it we would have it happen again <laughs> <laughs> no no god i'm, I'm thinking that through know. right so if we have um if we have a crash occur because of the debt ceiling becomes some sort of crisis that causes a crash right but let's even say we get spending back online within two weeks right let's just say it's a mm. it's a 20 percent stock crash but spending gets back online in two weeks but that's going to be enough of a crash for the fed to say well we're done raising rates right yeah and maybe if it lasts for a month, they could even say, "Oh, we got to go to zero percent interest, right?" To, mm. to spur on, spur on the economy, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so then you're cutting out, like at this point, ten percent of government spending on top of a month's yeah. worth of spending that never occurred, on top of yeah. some resolution to f continue to cut spending into the future. <laughs> oh no, that would be terrible, man. That would be. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, but it's got to be. It's got to be. We've got to, we've got to, got to get this done. <laughs> it, was, it was utter catastrophe. I, I just don't want it to be a month. I want it to be like two weeks or something of utter catastrophe. But it then, couldn't be two weeks because I don't think I don't think enough damage 
they don't have enough enough damage could be done because the schedule of the payments and the yeah yeah I, I think you'd need four to six weeks yeah to, to have yeah, right. to heal have real catastrophe happen it's still it's not COVID. it's like there's still stuff on the grocery shelves so i don't know man no this is i, was, I, was, I still it, i still want this to happen okay it, it if it could be if it could be isolated purely to the financial sector, I would say absolutely. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. But uh yeah. fair sh- enough. Yeah. Fair point. If it could if it could in any way bleed into Main Street. Cause what's yeah, what's wor- what's and, what's worrisome yeah. is um you could get stuck there, right? I, I mean <laughs> uh how do you mean? Because no, everyone would just realize, oh, okay, damn, oh, the government has to spend. Otherwise, we can't. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. what do you mean? How do you, how do you mean get stuck? I mean, I, I just think it would get it'd be so bad it would just get unstuck immediately. Okay, we'd, we'd never, okay. never have okay. that, this craziness again. Okay, okay. Unf- unfreedom party would just go away. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, yeah. it's like a total financial apocalypse. Okay, here's the here's the counter to that though. So they bring spending back on. Yeah. But the Fed has now brought interest rates to zero cuz they're very worried. Right. Right, which then creates a endogenous money collapse. Right. So so we actually have a banking crisis out of it. Like a a, a real financial crisis that comes out of it. A Minsky moment because of that. Right. Um, I guess in in your scenario, they've all my just... scenario. The school takes control. Okay, that's, okay, that's the thing. They okay. all become so, yeah. Mo- Mosler. They're all they're like oh, yeah. Warren yeah, was right. Okay, okay, that's right. Okay, that's okay. Right. okay. okay. It's, it, that's the that, that's the uh, thing about the normative yeah. apocalypse. It just becomes so bad that we just instantly we just we just, of, we just realize. Okay, you know, to, we used to horrify Bill Mitchell by moving to MIT. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's move to MIT. I I I hope if we do have catastrophe, that we make it to an MMT world at the end of catastrophe. But <laughs> I think there are so many spots that we can stop before we get to MMT after catastrophe that uh, uh, that we we get stuck there. Um, <laughs> uh, well, then in that case, it wouldn't be as big an apocalypse as I imagine. Yeah. So yeah. it would just be a mild, like, holy crap moment. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, um, yeah, Fed goes to zero rates and we have just a, a, a recession, but the government, government, um, you know, like quote unquote, does him. <laughs> it starts spending, spending again. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm dreaming. Uh, I, th- I think. Oh yeah. No, I'm having fun. Yeah. No, I'm dreaming, having fun. But, having fun you know, having fun obviously, I, I just really, ah, oh, you know, yeah, I'm allowed to dream. It's such a juicy <laughs> scenario, you know. Yeah. When when in history has purely like you know monetary operations at the Treasury of Fed ever like you know caused this whole sort of paradigm change in thinking that that just you know takes it takes a great country and just makes it. Like just super powered, you know, unre- unleashes everyone's you know potential, and you you just get rid of unemployment and all these crazy things going going away. Um, but yeah, you're just you're just boring. You're just bringing things down to earth, and it's going to take a lot longer. Okay, yeah, probably the climate will eventually get everyone thinking more like an MMT. Yeah, uh, I just yeah. This is just this little window where you know this apocalypse is is not quite you know minuscule chance. It's, it's possible. That we could have like yeah, one we could, percent yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah, we could end up total seen, and utter apocalypse. We could end up seeing it play out for for a few weeks, <laughs> and then it, then everything's like you know. Obviously, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's just just that's just too wildly optimistic. Um, we will the be apocalypse. finding out soon. That's for sure. <laughs> by by next live yeah, yeah. stream, we will likely have an answer oh All next right. next live stream will be may, will be may 31st and they, they say that wow. uh, that the deadline is yeah. uh yeah. is gonna be 
I'm still I'm still looking forward to it, even though I know the apocalypse <laughs> won't happen. I still yeah. like yeah, I'm still yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, I will be excited until until yeah. We should until the bank starts, you know, clamping down on, on us and uh, demanding fees and everything, and everything just degenerates. We should go but before then. We should go. Well, then. We should go proselytize outside the treasury building with you know, like repent. The end is near. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> signs, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> is anyone ever going to do that? Like you know, <laughs> monetary operations say the end is there. Oh God, <laughs> monetary operations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh yeah god, god doesn't hate your sin it's uh mosler hates your ignorance <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man um i've, I've hit on the, I, for tonight at least i've i've, I've hit on the, the main topics i want to i cool. see jesus has another question in chat i, I guess i i'm, I'm yep. not you seem to be on the up and up on this I, i'm not uh, terribly familiar what's that well this isn't he just asked about the insurance policies. Why banks have insurance policies? Oh, pretty I'm sure it's just a bit, of, a bit of a cash oh, cow. Oh, yeah. Them. Okay. And, okay. Um, okay. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Pretty lucky to be off people to take out life insurance on themselves. Uh, do people take out life insurance on themselves? Yeah, I guess people do that. Infinite banking. Ah. Uh, I think you. I think I've heard you mention infinite banking, Jesus, before, but I. I don't. I'm, I'm not. I have to confess, I'm not sure. I know what that is. Infinite banking. Um, but what is that? Anyway, if you can respond to that in the chat, Jesus, maybe I could think about it. But all I want to do now is um, what else? There was a because it'd probably be too old by next week, or maybe not. Just a couple of other things I wanted to point out from the yeah. international scene. Yeah. One was, um, like I already talked about John Bayes and his, and his uh, talk about the future of physics, which touches on, you know, asp aspects of you know, what you could do in a in the MMT world to get out of the mess that we're in. Aspects of also AGI that a question came up that he, he sort of had a funny answer to. Um, uh, yeah, what else is in the news? Uh, mermaids are real. There's actual real mermaids now. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if this is like the gig economy or whatever it is, but you can get it. You can become a professional sort of mermaid now. What are you? Uh, so my, my my daughter is uh, watching this reality show, and uh, you know they actually dive in aquariums for the public and uh, all sorts of things. Oh, they've had a they've had a mermaid show in Florida for. Years, I think, yeah. even before Disneyland uh, oh, okay. came about, or well, Disney—I'm uh, sorry, Disney World came about. It's Mer gone full private sector. I, I'm pr pretty sure it's pretty tricky in Canada being a mermaid. Bit of hypothermia involved. Uh, I just—I uh, <laughs> just Googled mermaids are real, and Google spits back no evidence of aquatic <laughs> humanoids has ever been found. No, it's not true. I saw it. On, I saw yeah. it on the telly. <laughs> saw it on the Netflix special. No. Uh, serious international news of Brexit. Interesting. Um, so I'm just going to now mention a couple of Bill Mitchell's recent yeah, things yeah. and then, may then maybe quickly on the New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. Interest rate yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, just real quick and then we can go. So Brexit turns out that latest data from the uh, British Statistics Office is that the immigration has been really good post Brexit. So it's uh, confounded all the Remain and naysayers. So they've got an increase in the non non e non EU country immigration, which has been really good because these are people who are like keen to work, they're industrious, and they've uh, helped the British economy. So that turned out to be good. And then the other thing uh, that Mitch Bill Bill was writing about was some um, economic research people. So these are just mainstream economists, um, a sort of going Marxist. Put that in quotes. Okay. So okay. They, they've realized that their models for inflation are all wrong. I mean, they just don't work. And they found that they're, they've come up with a, with a model or a theory for inflation that does work, and it pretty much fits 
fits the story, fits the data quite well, which is the conflict theory of inflation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is the, you know, the, um, the, the competition or conflict between wages and profits is uh, drives a hell, hell of a lot of inflation. And, um, and that was interesting because Bill talks about how they're citing this 1970, 70, 1977 paper by this guy, Roworth, who was a Marxist, but but he was kind of wrote respectable stuff and so people would sort of listen to him but um they only cite him whereas in fact you know there are a lot of marxist economists way way back who were writing about uh inflation being a, you know competition between uh, capital and labor so that was really interesting um i, I only just read that this morning so okay. i can't give you okay. any more on yeah, that yeah, but yeah. If, if you're interested in in that research from the mainstream might be interesting a good idea to check that out if you're interested in macroeconomics, not just um, the stock market. And finally, you and I were talking about this just before the live stream today. Uh, you'd, you'd even heard about this, right? Yeah, our, yeah, our yeah. Our New yeah, Zealand headline, Reserve yeah. Bank, Central Bank, hiked rates again. Yeah. And so did the yeah. Australians. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it's like what's, the, what's the reason? Because inflation is coming down. Yeah. And yeah. the reason is just, oh, it's not coming down fast, fast. enough. Yeah, yeah. And that's, ah, uh, I mean, uh, we're, again, I'm struggling because I'm a bit tired today. I'm struggling for words to describe that. I mean, I just pull out the old standard, you know, moronic. <laughs> Nothing more can be said about that. Yeah, it's just yeah. Complete uh, yeah, economic vandalism. Um, but as in the United States, it seems to be keeping our economy hot. So there is that. <laughs> Supporting the price structure. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is um, uh, w- one of the things I meant to bring up right out of the gate, too, was the Fed FOMC minutes did come out today that discussing, you know, what their path is going forward. And it sounds like uh, kind of a similar take, right? Half half the people think they should keep hiking rates because inflation's not quite under control yet and another half is uh like yeah we need to be data dependent whatever the hell that means um yep it just sucks being an mmt because you're like you want to see the rates go down but you know it's that's going to be cause some damage as well and so um you want to see the rates go down and the fiscal go up but be sort of as an mmt you sort of yeah. know that's not going to happen <sighs> this is so it's like yeah this is it's kind like, of ah. <laughs> This is kind of the trick because it's almost like once you start down a rate rate hike cycle, and and I think this is kind of at least where my thinking and and where the evidence seems to take me is once you go down a rate hike cycle, you're making kind of a deal with the devil, right? Yeah. Because right. How, how you're powering your economy now is through this yeah. this interest channel, yeah. Um, yeah. and there's no way off that train. I mean, yeah. there there is, but the way off is to say, hey, the economy needs this income. Um, you, you know, uh, the the fiscal side, you need to now supply it. Like we're done. That's right. But you need That's to supply right. it. And, and if 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 my yeah, thought exactly. is correct, right, the, the the kind of the path that I laid out, that needs to happen. Otherwise, um, if there's yeah. not an yeah, equal, you know, if there's not an equal and offsetting uh, fiscal expenditure, once the interest rates start to level out or come back down. Then that will right. it will set the stage for an actual yeah. endogenous yeah. side collapse. So yeah, um, what will the narrative be then? It's like you know, oh yeah, well there was this lag, so we. But uh, that's <laughs> it all worked. I mean, but, genius. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this though, what's really interesting is uh, I'm, I'm looking at the you know 2000 blow up. Uh, and then the 2008, right? I mean, it was it was in 2006 that we stopped the rate hike cycle from 2004 to 2006. Uh, effectively, it was June of 2000 that we stopped the rate hike cycle for uh, before the dot com bubble. So, you know, yeah. it, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, hmm. It it seems to be <laughs> there's something with the deceleration of the rate hike cycle. I I don't know if I fully, I mean, it's one of those things where it seems like there's, it's, it's clear in the evidence and in terms of how things play out that, 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 that might be the case, the exact transmission of how that happens uh, on a Mm -hmm. micro level through the banking system. I think I'm right about, Um, Mm -hmm. and if I am, then slowing down the rates here could Mm -hmm. 
potentially offset things. I mean, what would be, I guess what would be really devastating, just kind of thinking out loud is, okay, let, let's just say we get to the debt ceiling thing relatively unscathed, but we do cut spending. And then there is a desire to start to slow rate hikes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, then we could be getting enough of a double whammy to really be setting up, a, 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 yeah. you know, sow the seeds for a crisis yeah, uh, I reckon. A, a year down the line or two years down the line. Yeah. 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 That one, I'm, that one I'm not so excited for because that is a bit of a slow agony one. Yeah. It's not the yeah. apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's well, really. And there's no way, I mean, and if it happens, then it's just going to be, you know, blame the bankers again. Right. I mean, yeah. it, it'll just be a yeah. repeat of. Right it'd just be a repeat of blame it. Right. I mean, it's not going to be easily tied back to, um, the obvious answer. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. so anyway, yeah, we, we might get, we might get through that all a bit, a bit better in New Zealand because at least our current government seems willing to keep, keep spending going. Um, and, but yeah, still, still, you get a bit nervous though, because they, you know, the, the I just heard on the national radio here the other day. There's they still got things a little bit backwards, but but the interesting one was that um, when the Reserve Bank of New Zealand did raise the rates, the the, the sort of more conversational uh, radio show that where, where they talked about it, they they did mention that um, they were they're nervous because it injects money into the economy. So they got the interest income channel right. They're saying, you know, it's going to expand um, the government deficit through the interest payments. And so, I don't know, you know, may, maybe we're a little bit more advanced here than you guys are yeah. in the States. Yeah. At yeah. least, you know, less, less crazy stuff. But um, so, so maybe it won't be as bad here, but yeah. Because this is a scenario where it gets pretty ugly maybe next year. Anyway, on that could be happy said, note, could be uh, said in the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got anything else? Good, fun, you uh, man, I think uh, we can wrap it up for it. tonight. And uh, yeah. yeah, again, uh, by next live stream, it, it will be it will be decision decision date. Yep, twenty twenty three. So yeah, everyone is going to be on that before we get to the live stream. But at least we'll we'll have a bit of a advanced view of it. And yeah, like yeah. see if there's a. It'll be a couple of one day, is it? Or two well, it's days May, after May 31st that? will be the next stream. So, uh, Ju okay. June 1st is supposed to be. Oh, know, okay. I got the date wrong. It's supposed yeah. to be the day where, where we have to decide what, what oh. we're going to start cutting spending right. wise, prioritizing spending. It'll all be so, happening right yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, at least next weekend, then the week after will be something interesting. To yeah. Talk about. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. yeah. Anyway, well, thanks to the chat and everyone. Thanks, Jesus. Questions? Uh, I, actually, I'm seeing Josh come in with a question uh, right as we close out here. Um, yep. J J Jesus, I will oh, look in. I, I Google it. I have the infinite uh, the infinite life insurance thing pulled up. So I'll give it a look. I, I don't know if I fully understand what's going on there, but I'll, I'll give it a look, and, and maybe we can talk next week. Josh, um, I did listen to Steve Keen's interview with Lex Friedman. Um, why, why I'm, I'm curious, why were you disappointed with it? Just never got deep enough or what? Um, is that the one he did a while back or recently? Yeah, I think it was at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's talking about the mark. He, he it was mostly about Marxism. Yeah. Yeah. His de debunking economics plus debunking the, uh, the Marxist labor theory of value and so forth. Lex Friedman. Steve. I think it's Friedman. But maybe he pronounces it Freed. Oh wow, it's been ten months already. Holy cow! Yeah, ten months ago. Yeah. Two almost two one point six million views. Damn. Yeah, yeah. That that's the thing that graded on me. It's like <laughs> that, that got so many views, but it wasn't really. <laughs> uh, MMT was mentioned, maybe a little bit, but not yeah. much. And it's mostly going on about I think. I think Steve Steve King was talking to his audience there, right? So I would I wouldn't. Yeah, you know I, I don't think it was a bad bad interview. I think it was really pretty informative for people who were listening to it. It's just that you know, um, you want to you want to also hear the reality about what 
what today's uh, monetary system and macroeconomics, uh, how it all works, rather than go back into the past and just debunk um, neoclassicals and debunk the, you know, the Marxist view um, on theory of value. I mean, because but 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 to be fair, that's that is Steve's, yeah, basic main yep. main uh, emphasis these days is the role of energy in production. Yeah, and so yep. I don't I don't uh, begrudge him for trying to get that story out. Yeah. Also, if you want a good rant on all of that, try Ty Keynes's uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, man, plug Ty again. Yeah, good, uh, yeah. Play it, play it at two times speed. It's a really good, uh, you know, <laughs> really good high frequency cuss words <laughs> for the righteous, righteous effect. Yeah. All right. All right, man. Um, Do you have an outro for um, us this week? Should we have yeah. a go? Yeah, go for it. Head on, head on out. I'll see you next week. But before we do, I'll just say. Equal credits to ChatGPT for this limerick. Um, I had I had to tweak it quite a bit to get the rhyming right. You know, there's no, there wasn't any decent word that rhymes with ledger. <laughs> so, so maybe next week I'll think try to think of think of one that uses like something like hedger for someone hedging. Is oh that, yeah, is that a word? Yeah, yeah. hedging. Yeah, yeah, a, a hedger. Yeah, yeah. Ledger and hedger. I'll try to yeah. I'll try to get that in. But let me know. Let me know which of these outros you like. So, fellow MMTers, macro traders, there once was a treasury bold whose currency converted to gold. Default, you say? Fool. We have gold printing tools called miners, all crippled and old. And then the next one, in the land where the greenbacks are better, with money recorded by letter. Default, you say? Nay, we type our own pay, a method without any fetter. Come back next week. Same MMT time, same MMT channel. We are out of here. All right. Thanks for listening in. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Yep.